Hello and welcome to episode 49 of Hit the Books Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Holcomb. And I'm Emery Saunders. And we're here to give you all the saucy deets on everything comics this week. For those of you unfamiliar with the show, this is your weekly comic book podcast where Emery and I, and perhaps a guest, run you through all the latest news and the newest releases coming to your local comic book shops. Please support your local comic book shops. And discuss a topic about the world of comics for your amusement. If that sounds like a good time, be sure to hit like and subscribe and rate well elsewhere. It really does help us out. Uh, remember, you can always check us out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash hit the books if you'd like to support us. And then, of course, we're on Twitter at HTP vids and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hit the books. I've finally given in. I'm trying to put us on Instagram and manage all our social medias, but I uh, just it's tedious. We caved. Uh, I still won't cave for SoundCloud, though. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> uh, but you can still find us on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, all sorts of various podcasting services of your choosing. So look forward to that. Uh, today's probably going to be a shorter episode because there's, quite frankly, not a lot of news besides uh, COVID-19 and its effects on the industry. We talked very heavily about the effects. We have some updates for our local comic book shops. Uh, if you're interested in hearing kind of how it's affecting things now that everything's kind of been enacted. Um but it's having devastating effects on basically every level of the industry. So uh, that's pretty much going to be the majority of the news today. And it's nothing necessarily new from last week. There's a handful of new news, but it's pretty small relative to our usual episodes. So uh, this will probably be a quick and short episode. Um, however, if you are really hurting for entertainment, uh, feel free to check out the first episode of our comic movie Masterless series, uh, that one featuring the first full feature-length film that went to theaters called Superman and the Mole Men, circa 1951, and the first entry into the arena of the comic movie Masterless. Feel free to go check that out. There is a free link in the description to a Daily Motion posting of it, so you don't have to purchase it or anything like that to view it. It's free for any and all newcomers that want to watch it it's great you know time capsule film uh we as a people have come a very long way it's nice to see the evolution so uh if you really want to check that out by all means please check it out um it's the first entry in the series and there's a lot more to go oh yeah the next one in the series is batman circa 1966 Starring Adam West and Burt Ward. (laughs) We did a little previewing of the trailer just now. Yep. Oh, we are in. (laughs) We are in for a ride. We are in for a time. That time being 1966. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Uh, It's outlandish. Yeah. It it was a different time back then. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that one's going to be even more fun than the Superman and the Mole Men, because that one is way over the top <laughs> compared to most superhero movies, uh, even the comedic ones. So uh, that one should be a good watch. We also have a free link we found for that from The Toy Box, which is uh, actually on Facebook, uh, Facebook posting that we will send out on our social medias, and I will also put it in the description of this video so you have access to it easily. By all means, take it, take advantage of it. Don't rat anybody out, because we know WB is very uh, tight with their rights. Um, so, obviously, view it for research for the viewing of the episode. But uh, if you can support them, by all means, support them and purchase the movie that way. Just or watch, rent it, whatever. Just watch it. Shush! Yeah, I don't know if it's technically public domain yet. I, in normal laws, it wouldn't be, but you know these these companies they find workarounds for everything, which is why Superman is still not public domain, <laughs> and why Mickey Mouse is still not public domain, despite their age. Yeah, they they keep finding ways to renew and re up their deals so that way they can keep all of their money going in house. As always. Yeah. So look forward to that. It is coming down the bend, and it will most likely be our episode next week. Instead of doing a full podcast episode, because, spoiler for the news, there's really nothing coming out anymore. Um, Right. We will seek to entertain you with our next entry of the comic movie Master List. And I will be finally posting the compiled list of the comic movie Master List movies for your research if you want to 
get a jump start on that. I know one of our fans, um, Scott, had reached out and was asking uh, when the posting would go up for the full list of movies. So, Scott, that'll be coming out within this week. So look forward to that. Keep checking the site if you so choose, or at the very least our Twitter. That's probably where I'm going to post it first. It is quite the list with a lot of surprising entries, to say the least. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Emery, what have you been reading? Uh, well, here at the end of the world, I thought I would uh, read some Scott Snyder Batman. And lo and behold, that Scott Snyder Batman that I read was uh, a trade paperback called The Last Night on Earth. Man, I was not ready for that story. Yeah, you were talking about it a little bit while we were, we grilled out today, so we had a lot of food. A little lethargic today. A little so bit. I got a lot digesting right now. But uh, you didn't sound very hot on it. Uh, I mean, it's a premise that... While it does make sense, it flies in the face of the very core tenant of the Batman character, let alone the Batman mythos. And not even in a way that's wholly new or interesting, now that I think about it. Um, just to give you, those of you watching out there, a uh, context for this story that Scott Snyder had dreamt up. The very first issue starts with what we assume is Bruce Wayne finally, somehow, the, like the one thing that I thought would have been really interesting if they kept it to this. Bruce Wayne in the insane asylum. And from there, not only does it make a weird collection of reveals, specifically um, what it is that he's doing there, why it is that he's still young, and for some reason, Alfred, who is pretending to be the same age that we've always seen him, is looking more like he's in his late 70s. And then from there, we find ourselves reading a story that one manages to have a Batman cowl sewn into a straitjacket, but then taking that and then later finding like a full suit after having escaped from what I am coming to the realization was a building buried underground with a just by random a found head of the Joker. Just his head, preserve Futurama style, for some weird reason. And from there, it just goes fully into this weird and ridiculous tale of another, like, end-of-the-world story where uh, we're finding out that uh, cloning has happened, villains have just mostly been wiped out heroes have been mostly wiped out there's a last bastion of a resistance and well the premise for this whole thing the the whole story that this is uh the the, the core idea that the story is predicated on is an argument an argument between Lex Luthor and Superman so the entire crux of the story Literally has nothing to do with Batman. Like, at all. It's effective storytelling. <laughs> I, I'm down. <laughs> Why not? Um, yeah, I'm going to spoil it because I fucking hate this story. Um, the argument that goes down between uh, Lex Luthor and Superman is one where Lex Luthor just poses the question to, you know, just the... People of the world saying, yeah, you know, if you 
just prefer to do evil acts, just do evil acts and just agree with me that we should just be bad and not good. And this, for some reason, activates this weird thing of like kryptonite seeds that he had put like into like the earth that would, if the people decided to be good in mass, then all of these things would grow up into spikes that would kill Lex Luthor because he, Lex Luthor could just make them do that, I guess. But if all of the people just agreed to be bad and mass, all of those kryptonite spikes would just uh, grow up out of the ground and kill Superman instead. And well, it it as it turns out, uh, those uh, those spikes of public opinion decided to go the way of killing Superman. Great. <laughs> I, I have questions, but I don't think I want them answered. <laughs> so I'm just not going to ask. <laughs> I will answer one question that I'm sure you're wanting to ask. No, they did not destroy Nightwing in this one. Really? <laughs> well, I might l- read this book. They were too busy destroying Batman. That's fine. <laughs> We don't need him. <laughs> that was clearly illustrated in Batman and Son that we do not need Bruce Wayne Batman. <laughs> Just hand the mantle over to Dick. Just let him finally do the thing that you've been draining him to do this whole time. Even D- though he doesn't want to. Even though he doesn't want it. He'd rather be Nightwing. But he had I, to. I think this is... He the, had to. Is this the reason Jeff Johns hates Nightwing is because <laughs> Nightwing would rather be Nightwing than try to be Batman? Probably. <laughs> among several other reasons that I can't comprehend, but you know, you do you, Jeff Johns. Or you know what? Don't. <laughs> uh, how about Jeff Johns relinquish his title and hand it off to someone who doesn't just openly uh, try to like have one hero throughout the entire DC pantheon just either murdered or shat upon or forced to fuck a gorilla relentlessly. <laughs> fuck. Come on, Jeff. You're a good writer. You have great stories, but come on. He has good Green Lantern stories. Let's be clear. <laughs> he had a flash run, too. He, yeah, he had a flash run. I'm not going to say it's good. <laughs> <laughs> you. Sounds like we got some hot, saucy takes here. Look, as someone who is a uh, cursory fan of The Flash, uh, let's just say I had gotten used to Wally being The Flash and bringing back Barry. I mean, it was the same thing as bringing back Superman after the death of Superman. It was like, oh, this whole thing, this whole like arc of growth, and we're just going to say, fuck it? No. Nah. Nah, mm-mm. <laughs> rebirth was uh, re- rebirth was stupid, and then they turned an entire like rebooting of the comics and titled that Rebirth. <laughs> mm. uh. I don't know. It did give me New Fifty Two, so I'm not that concerned about it. But I feel like you were a little more harsh on the storyline than I was. To me, it was just an excuse to make a new universe. I mean, it was. Which they've yeah, done. So was Flashpoint. Which Jeff Johns has led <laughs> them doing too many times now. But, you know. Hot take. Um, you probably shouldn't reboot your universe two or three times in a decade. That's just not good practice. Yeah, no. It's not to say you should never reboot it, but mm, a three times in a decade is a bit much. It's a bit much. There's... We keep breaking continuity every time. Yeah, it's not good. It's not a good look. Nah. Anything else you've been reading, watching, listening, playing related to comic book media? Hmm. I mean, obviously, we've been living The Walking Dead, but that's a whole different, <laughs> a whole different <laughs> side story that I don't want to get into right now. Uh, thanks, Robert Kirkman. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's uh, that's all we wanted was for you to 
you know, predict the future. I love how they, they weren't able to finish the latest episode finale of The Walking Dead. And so they're just airing the episode before it as the finale. Oh, no. <laughs> and then they're going to show the the actual finale <laughs> later on sometime in some vague, unknown future. At some point, we'll get back to it. <laughs> good luck. As soon as we get all this. I kind of wonder what the ratings are like. They can't be good. Oh, no. I'm I sure mean, it's the best thing AMC's got, but they can't be good. Uh, they keep trying to make Preacher a thing. Yeah, until they stopped trying to make Preacher a thing. I haven't watched it yet. Comic's very good, though. Uh, yeah. So uh, I haven't had a lot of time to dive into comic book stuff. Been pretty busy, again, working from home. So every time we shoot an episode, I got to tear down the office <laughs> to put up the studio stuff. And I have to tear down the studio stuff to put up my office uh, where my girlfriend and I have been working. My brother's been working up in the dining room. So the house is a mess. The world is a mess. And schedules are a mess, but somehow we're releasing more consistently than ever before. So <laughs> I guess, you know, there's plus sides to it. Um, that is one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just keeping it at 100, okay? <laughs> uh, but I did manage to read uh, one mega sized issue, the 80th anniversary Robin comic, which. Oh, did you? Has probably the stupidest dick grayson story i've ever read there's a lot of stupid stories in that book i'm not you know i'm not gonna call anybody out but i'm gonna call people out Uh, this book now these 100 page issue spectaculars where there are a bunch of short stories they are almost never good i don't know why i bothered to read this but i'm such a dick grayson mark and i you know i (laughs) love i like all of the the robins to be honest all the the main four i don't count stephanie brown Something about those boy wonders. I guess. I don't know. I like the underdog, you know? I like the <laughs> one that's always, you know, trying to overcome things. I feel Sometimes I feel like Bruce Wayne is so ridiculous as a character sometimes that it's just hard to humanize him because he's oh, just you, insanely, unattainably rich billionaire uh, who you, just happens to dress in a leather bat costume and be a top tier ninja and be just genetically so perfect that he's attractive and he's like six foot six or whatever and he's a ridiculous amount of weight (laughs) literally living one year as someone like that would fuck their shit up eventually someone hits you in the face now again eventually someone shoots you in the mouth he's a comic book character so (laughs) who the fuck cares you know (laughs) but he just he's hard to sympathize with now to be fair dick grayson doesn't have the most common origin story in the world either (laughs) being you know the child of circus performers who were killed by the mob and then he was adopted by said ultra rich billionaire but Dick Grayson is more human, in my opinion. The way he behaves, the way he's more, much more sympathetic, the way he has a sense of humor. Wait a minute. Young circus performer kid loses his parents and is taken in by the... Ba- are, are you sure we're not talking about Jason Todd? <laughs> <laughs> Jason Todd is a circus performer as a human being as a <laughs> as a personality he was not in fact the ch- child of a circus performer right <laughs> <laughs> totally different situation bro. totally different <laughs> he was stealing the batmobile's wheels and got caught and batman decided you know what this kid's got a bright future ahead of him <laughs> <laughs> but um bright future more like oh this kid he has no problem doing crime. Yeah, yeah, I'll make him a vigilante. <laughs> but back to the book. It's got a bunch of short stories. It focuses more on Dick Grayson than any of the other characters, although Tim Tim Drake gets uh, a large portion of the book, as he should. Cause he's, he's earned it. <laughs> he's obviously probably been the most recognizable Robin of our generation. And since Dick Grayson was primarily the campy Robin, you know, (laughs) the seventies and eighties changed that a little bit, you know, before Nightwing came along, but he was still kind of known for being the campy elf boy who was acrobatic and did flips and 
ran beside Adam West that, in, in uh, the 1960s. Violent, uh, booty shorts wearing teenager. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, so, you know, a lot of people kind of look at Tim Drake <laughs> as the Robin, despite that Damien is the current Robin, Damian Wayne, and then Jason Todd had a brief stint before the fans hated him so much they elected to have him murdered. Damien. Which... So that's all. <laughs> it's all part of the canon. Um, like full ninja 10-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's fine. It's fine. Uh, well, Batman like... and Robin is a great book. <laughs> that's the book that made me love Damien. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, we're just it, gonna have to roll with it. it. It's a great book, as long as Dick is Batman, and he should be, <laughs> because if anybody's gonna dress in a big leather bat costume, it should be the circus boy, <laughs> not the head of a billion dollar empire. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> not that that makes any more sense anyway. <laughs> God, I, comics, I mean... comics are stupid. <laughs> It, it, we really are fucking nerds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it it's a very ridiculous idea on its face, but uh, somehow it's it works. Yeah, it it's worked. It's gotten legs. I mean, back then it was basically uh, it was a different Zorro, basically more different Zorro, modern Zorro, I, I suppose. Yeah, it was like capes, hot ladies. Uh, sticking it to other rich people while you yourself are rich. That, 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 that's Zorro. Straight up. So I'll give you just the cliff notes of each independent story, at least what I can remember of them. Again, very forgettable. Most of them very generic. Some of them try to convey a nice, heartfelt story and just fall short because it's just not... It's not logical uh, <laughs> how the characters are interacting. And it may be just because it's rushed, you know, because they only have so many pages in this whole 100 page special to convey a story or a message the first story is the stereotypical you know campy robin dick grayson is 18 it's his 18th birthday they go out on a mission they're trying to you know communicate but dick grayson expresses that he wants to be his own man and his own hero and that he he can't follow batman's rules anymore because they just don't make sense for him and to him and then they have this kind of forced, heartwarming moment where Dick Grayson says, I love you, but I can't do this anymore, which is very different than the actual breakup. The actual oh, breakup was yeah. very kind of angry and violent and did not go over well with either party and yeah, the became a bitter root for Nightwing himself and Batman both for several you know, iterations of the characters. Yeah, Batman the Animated Series actually, I think, did a really good job with that story. They did. They really did. So um, this is like an alternate retelling, and then they flash to a panel after Dick Grayson leaves, and Batman's silent the whole time, and Batman thinks to himself, I'm sorry, Dick, I had to be hard on you so that you could go be your own man. And I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously i obviously i didn't enjoy that i like the idea of what they were trying to do but i don't think it worked uh, and, and i gotta say the the art in this entire book is very mediocre very mediocre i mean we're all about mediocre here on hit the books podcast but it was very underwhelming the next story was probably the best story in the whole book oh, but yeah. again that's not saying much because you know these special special issues are never is like quite as good as they could be. Although there have been exceptions in the past, this just isn't one of the good ones. It's a tiny vignette. Yeah. So this one is Nightwing in Bloodhaven, and he's saving some people. His bridge falling apart, and he's doing all these things. And this kid admires him, and, and uh, he saves this one lady, and she decides to name him after Nightwing. And he says, "Well, Nightwing's not really a common name," you know, joking as <laughs> Nightwing does. And this. This is what made the story work, is that there was humor, like funny humor throughout yeah. the entire book where Nightwing was saying funny things, as you would expect from a lighthearted Dick Racing character, which is very unlike the other stories in the book. <laughs> and so he's making jokes and everything throughout the book. And uh, then at the end, you know, he says, why don't you name name the baby Robin? That's a much more common name. And that's the end of the book or uh, the end of the story. It's fine. 
the artwork was very that was probably the best <laughs> artwork in the book it was very kind of 90s late 90s early 2000s nightwing which is always great for me because that's my favorite nightwing for the most part um they didn't put a mullet on him did they <laughs> no not not mid 90s oh thank god yeah. so uh no mullet thankfully but that was that was a good book. That was a good short story. Is fine. The next one is the one I really have issue with. Oh, this one focuses on the Grayson era of Dick Grayson, where Dick Grayson is tortured to near death, manages to somehow not die in the murder machine, and this stupid Jeff John story. And oh, this is a Jeff John's joint. <laughs> yeah, this led to the the end of the New Fifty Two, basically. But uh, you know. In a distant sort of way. Yeah. And Dick Grayson becomes a secret detective for Tom King's first major book. Uh huh. Called Grayson, where he joins the organization Spiral uh, undercover and becomes a, a secret agent with them and does all this secret agent stuff so that Tom King should could have a character to write about. Tom King is a good writer. Uh, you know, he's a good dialogue writer. He's a good. Yeah, you know, I hated this book before it came out. I was like, this idea is stupid. Why are you doing it with Nightwing of all characters? Just doesn't make sense. You know, why didn't they just make a new character and make a secret agent book for Tom King if they really wanted to do that? Or maybe they were just afraid of pissing off fans by killing outright Nightwing, which they absolutely would have. <laughs> but. Um, that would have been a bold strategy. A, a stupid strategy, but you, know, <laughs> you do you, Jeff Johns. Or don't. Please don't. I'm very bitter. So <laughs> this storyline focuses in that timeline. Now, in this short story, Dick Grayson is trying to help this ape rebellion. And if you're familiar with the DC canon, there's a, a gorilla city uh, where there's a lot of highly intelligent uh, gorilla people, basically. And there's a few supervillains that come out of that that obviously require some superhero aid from time to time. So Dick Grayson is there training a new recruit uh, for Spiral and basically giving lessons that Batman gave him, but in the opposite direction. So Batman said, you know, always plan your landing. And Dick Grayson goes, just improvise on the fly. We'll see where we land, that sort of thing. (laughs) And... It all comes to this conclusion at the end. And the final lesson, don't listen to me. You have to do what's best for you. And I was like, why would Batman ever say that? Ever. <laughs> so that that the whole the the character moment in the story was ridiculous and didn't make any sense. Do what's best for you. That's what we went with. It basically it went with here are these strict rules and then final rule, there's no rules. Just do what you want. Okay, great what lesson the f- there. Mm. Great lesson there. Again, making this relationship way more peaceful than it actually was. Oh, yeah, this is revisionist history. Revisionist now, history. Yeah, definitely a lot of revisionist history in this book. Oh, my God. Now, the biggest fucking ridiculous thing in this book was that in order for Dick Grayson to get the gorilla army to help him fight this other gorilla army Mm -hmm. threatening the world is that he had to prove his love to this professor who is from gorilla city who was using mind control to make him view her as a hot redheaded human and then she reveals herself to be a red-haired ape and then says if you want my father's aid, you will have to show your genuine love to me, or my father will see right through you. And then they proceed to take hands and walk into a bedroom. They made Dick Grayson fucking ape. Did he make sure to bring his bat lube? They made <laughs> Dick Grayson <laughs> fucking <laughs> ape. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote this again? <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> now, I Who did this? <laughs> now, t- this might be Tom King's fault, but I don't know because I didn't finish the whole Grayson arc. I read probably to issue 20-ish, maybe less than that, somewhere in the teens. 
I don't uh, remember this. Our, uh, I don't what? know if this is a new thing or what? if this actually happened in some way, shape, or form. Although I've read some articles saying that this is a thing that was suspected but is now confirmed because of this book. I was going to say those damned dirty apes. But I think people would get me confused in thinking that I'm talking about the apes from Gorilla City when I'm talking about the writers at DC. <laughs> so, <laughs> what the? F- yeah, it's how? terrible. It's terrible. How did it's we awful. not so, just literally put in the book, but advocate for fucking gorillas? <laughs> literally, the last Dick Grayson story in this book is the most <laughs> insulting shit possible. <laughs> It basically says, Dick Grayson will stick his dick into anything. Great. Y- y- you know, Thanks, guys. You know what they should have had? That's what we needed to focus on. What they should have had was uh, Dick, well, being a dick and saying, uh, yeah, this whole peace treaty thing. Yeah, fuck that. I'm not fucking an ape. <laughs> it's for the world. It's, it's, it's almost... Like, there ought to be some sort of established standards for what is and isn't something that we write in a comic book. It like, does, it, fucking an animal. It does imply <laughs> It does imply that Dick's dick is life-saving. In fact, world-saving. Uh, you know what else we could have implied? That Dick, instead of listening to whatever fucking rule compelled him to fuck an ape, (laughs) he would have, I don't know, listened to some common sense and said, I don't care what fucking circumstance I'm in. The world could die tomorrow from nuclear holocaust. I am never fucking an ape. Never. <laughs> well, Dick Grayson what? did. Okay, y- you Apparently. know what? You know what else should have happened? An editor should have read that story and said no to the to the the writer. No. Uh, come here. I'm not just going to tell you no. I'm going to tell you you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's bad. I. I- they let they let some of these writers get away with so much nonsense in the main canon. If it's not a main canon story, it's fine. It's an elsewhere's whatever. You know, if Kevin Smith wants to make Batman pee his pants and cry for his mommy in an alternative <laughs> universe, <laughs> fine. I almost forgot him. Fine. That. But if he's doing this in canon, <laughs> never let him write a book again. <laughs> and then he did it again. You did it twice. <laughs> Come on, Kevin. More respect has been paid to the wildly murderous villain of Batman called the Joker than has ever been paid to this orphan circus child who has been, uh, one, rigorously trained into being a uh, child uh, soldier ninja. And then, throughout all of the bullshit that he had to go through, manages to uh, still kind of basically raise himself in between the beatings of random criminals while wearing booty shorts. Uh, He raises himself, somehow manages to complete schooling, and still become his own hero with far less... Issues and hangups than his predecessor. And yet our writers have seen fit to have him fucking a what the fuck is happening? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I don't I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. Oh. I just they published it, so uh, clearly it, somebody's to blame. Uh, it it hurts me. It hurts me deep that this is how they treat their heroes. This is how they treat someone like Nightwing, someone who has been around 
damn near since uh, the inception of Batman. Like, after they made Batman, Robin was not very far behind at all. No. <laughs> and this is how they do him in the current day. Dirty. They yeah. do him dirty. You, d- they do him dirty like the damn dirty apes they are. It's true. God. Uh, so next up, we had the Jason Todd story. He only got one. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> uh, and basic, basically, it's Red Hood jumping back to his memories with Bruce Wayne, uh, where Bruce Wayne and Alfred were trying to console him and try to, to help him grow as a person. And then at some point, you know, it basically illustrates that he was actually a pretty sweet kid before the Robin stuff began. Uh, overall, and he tra- basically worked to fix a watch that Thomas Wayne had given Bruce Wayne, but had not worked in a long time, and he was working on working on it, and then he told Batman at one point, you know, can I give this back to you? It, it basically gave it to him as a birthday present, and then he said, can I give this back to you once I've finished repairing it fully? And he goes, yes. And then it goes forward to him dying and then being resurrected and all this stuff and then it ends with red hood leaving the watch fully repaired on the batmobile one night and then saying happy birthday from a distance all dramatic like and then leaving you mean it's the type to tell me (laughs) it's the type of story that kevin smith would cry over you mean to tell me that there is <laughs> that Jason Todd gets a well-told story? Yeah, and Dick fucks an ape. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd say I, we're in the upside down. You know, it's confirmed. The second <laughs> Dick Grayson story is probably the most fun in the book. I'd say the Jason Todd story is the most well written in the book which again isn't saying that much because it's you know a collection of eh, stories if not terrible stories like the eight fucking one <laughs> that had no point whatsoever um but they it was, just wanted to they just wanted to make him fucking an ape cannon they really did though that's so oh uh then we get oh. to the the tim drake stuff the tim drake stuff there's a I think there's two of the Tim Drake stories. I don't recall the first one because it's just eh, kind of going through his history. And then the second one, I believe, was talking about how he uh, was. I think it has something to do with the current Batman canon, but I'm not caught up. So I wasn't really aware of what they're referring to. But they're referring of making some kind of Gotham Knights initiative with Batman. And they wanted tim drake to come back to the mantle of robin basically and and lead the group which includes batman so that's an interesting dynamic i don't i don't know if that's a new thing or if that's a thing that existed at some point that i just missed completely or i i don't know what that is but basically he's not red robin in this particular book and like he's just robin yeah and so he basically the story tim drake goes to all the other robins including damien you know, former Robins and talks Mm -hmm. to them about what they think, because, you know, everybody thinks that Dick Grayson was the original choice, but Dick Grayson says, you know, I don't want to do this. You know me. I like the less I'm around Bruce, the better and that, (laughs) that sort of thing. That's Uh, the night wing. I know. (laughs) And, but he's really nice and encouraging and tells Tim, you know, he's easily the most intelligent of the Robins and he should absolutely take this leadership role. And, take the initiative if he feels up to the challenge or blah 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 then he goes to jason todd and jason todd's a lot more mean about it and says quit being a pussy you know just (laughs) just do whatever you need to do and quit bothering me that sort of thing then he goes to damien and damien's just a an asshole (laughs) (laughs) Uh, as you would expect from you know classic damien but damien in the end kind of has a point and uh tim realizes that he's right and this is what he should do and so it ends with him accepting Batman's offer to lead this Gotham Knights initiative as Robin. And huh. that's the end. Now, uh, it was fine. Nothing wrong with it, but I wasn't, you know, 
it was nice to see him interacting with all the other Robins, which I always like. I like when the family dynamic returns, even if it's brief. Yeah. Just to see them interacting with each other, because you kind of wonder, you know. Like, what would they all be like under one roof? Yeah, so... Oh my god, that you know, would be obviously the most fucking dysfunctional family. <laughs> oh my fucking god. <laughs> you know, now we've gotten little tastes of this. Uh, I know there was a little bit of that during Death of the Family for New 52. They're, yeah, they were kind of hopping they between. Did do that, didn't Joker kind of brought the family together more than anybody else could, <laughs> I- ironically. <laughs> Again, Joker getting more respect than Dick Grayson, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> oh god, that reminds me of one of the things that I remember hating about the last night on earth story for some reason the uh still functional severed head of joker he he literally will not shut up about wanting to be robin and then when they watch a child be killed right in front of him uh hit the words that will never escape my mind is oh you just watched another perfectly good Robin die in front of you. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Savage. I, I mean, Which is what we expect. Which, which is what we expect from Joker. The one character that you can always, always count on being given more respect than any of Batman's sidekicks. Yeah. Uh, the next story, we get a Stephanie Brown story that's very brief and very stupid. Uh, it's not even... Much like Stephanie Brown. Oh. You know, it's it's not even worth mentioning, in my opinion. <laughs> it's basically Stephanie Brown just not listening to Batman the entire story. And then the <laughs> the end of the book is Batman saying, look, I know you need to be your own person, but you're going too far. Like, you need to fucking listen or you're going to die. <laughs> and then the end of the book is her going, I do what I want, you know. <laughs> and then swinging away in dramatic fashion. And I'm like, oh, that was terrible. Just like Stephanie Brown's run <laughs> <laughs> was also terrible. And Just then, let her be the spoiler and never ever make her a Robin, please. Yeah. And then the final story is less of a story and more of just a recapping of what Damian Wayne's origin and story context has been. Uh, they did include the Batman Inc. story where he's murdered by his clone, which is Cl- stupid. Clones. Yeah, his grown adult clone. Just stupid. It, if we learned, I it, thought it was dumb when they murdered him in the first place because of why and how they did it. Yeah, and they had all this heavy advertising about it, and then you actually read it, and you're like, "This doesn't make any fucking sense." So why did <laughs> why did any of this happen? And it just and then they all forgot. Like <laughs> they eventually had a big storyline where Batman goes to basically hell to get him back, but like he's fucking Kratos up, or some bullshit. Yeah, but up to that point. There's just nothing. There's just nobody like there's one issue per character in the family mm-hmm. that kind of reminisces on Damien and that's it. Then they don't fucking talk about it for <laughs> for oh a, like God. a year and a half or two years, whatever it was, before they made the story where he wears the specialized bat suit and goes to apocalypse and does all this crazy shit to basically revive Damien. <laughs> Yeah, and it, yeah. If there's one whatever. thing that I learned from reading Spider-Man in the '90s, is that well, you can never really go wrong when you bring clones into the mix. Clones really do ruin any story ever. Literally, literally. Yeah. So, again, the book's out there. If you want it for the collectible value, by all means, try to get it. It's going to be hard to get it right now because a lot of comic shops are closed, but a lot of them are still trying to do shipments whenever they can get their shipments from Diamond, you know. So as long as they get their products, which is going to be our, on our news topics, it'll be there. Just went a little long on that one, but... It, a little bit. Again, there's not a whole lot to talk about outside of that. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the news. Again, not that many news items. Um, Obviously, the, the main focus is COVID-19. We talked a lot about it on the past two episodes, so feel free to reference those if you want more of an inside scoop. However, uh, the biggest news story is probably Diamond shutting down uh, more or less as of April 1st. The reason being is because most retailers can't receive the books right now because they're being forced by their governors or the presidents or, you know, whichever country's parliament or whatever governing body is in effect 
They are not able to maintain their open doors to allow customers in with the fear of spreading COVID-19 and quote unquote flattening the curve. But it's putting a lot of strain on the industry from the bottom up. And Diamond is taking uh, the steps to not uh, send any more shipments after uh, the orders of April 1st, which will be this week, because they simply can't. They just can't hold all of these comics in a warehouse until the retailers can finally receive them for one reason or another. And it makes sense, you know, logistically. But now this is leading to a lot of discussion throughout the market, both from the publisher side all the way through to the the customer and retailer that how do we handle distribution of comics until this is over and b check out our topic of the show last week is this the end of the physical medium of comic books is it going to have to be all digital because it's forced its hand with this epidemic this pandemic the question continues to be pondered but uh Solid answers have yet to be given. Which is one of the complaints listed on this. If you want to kind of see a personal take on this, go to newsarama.com, which is one of our best news sources. And it's CBR is okay as well, but CBR tends to be flooded with advertisements and videos and stuff. And you can't, you can't even open a single page without it crashing your browser because of all the ads and all the videos that automatically start playing and just... There, so, there's I, an absurd amount that they have on their website that just isn't even the thing that you're there for. Yeah, so I tend to recommend Newsarama a little bit more personally, but feel free to go to whichever media site you trust. But uh, Vanita Rogers wrote this awesome article where she basically got quotes from various um, distributors and comic book store owners, including uh, Ryan Seymour from Comic Town here in Columbus, Ohio, which is up in the northwest side of the city. Which is always good to see your yeah. local comic book shops getting a shout out and uh, a quote in this article. But it's a good read if you want to go read it. It's it's on um, the main page right now. It was published on March 25th. So you should be able to find that pretty easily. The title is Comic Book Retailers Struggling After Diamond Pulls Plug on New Comics. And then goes through a bunch of quotes that are obviously very focused on how it's affecting uh, the areas. So I'll just read a few of these quotes here, just so you can kind of get some context. Um, First uh, comment here comes from Ben Ray, owner of Atomic Books in Baltimore, Maryland. I think this needs to be a pause for all comics, regardless of format, meaning no new comics for digital retailers either. Otherwise, it gives them an unfair advantage and makes any books stalled in the pipeline utterly unsellable. Not to mention turning this into an opportunity to cut shops out altogether and get more folks to buy digital comics. Digital release will keep the comic readers interested, but it won't put any money in the shops that provide these collectibles and a source for parents to keep their kids off the iPads or computer 24-7, said Luis uh, Nieves. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Nieves, owner of Aegis Comics in Alaska. Quote, our customers, many of them eBay eBay sellers, can no longer support their hobby of flipping a digital copy. The removal of the physical print copy disrupts this geek ecosystem. End quote. Uh, Ryan Seymour of Comic Town in Columbus, Ohio, which is the guy we just mentioned, our local comic book shop, one of them. On one hand, material will still be getting into the hands of readers, which is good. The downside is this may be the first step to phasing out hard copies altogether. We need to keep readers interested and engaged at almost any cost. Quote, both Marvel and DC have done digital first comics, then followed up with hard copies that have been successful to an extent with that. If they did something along those lines for the comics being discussed and offered to make them returnable or add some cool comic exclusive content to the hard copies, I feel like this would be really solid middle ground that would satisfy almost all parties. So then it goes into some details about what's going on. Um, They talk about the lack of communication that they're receiving, about how frustrated they are that Diamond leaked (laughs) basically the news that they were not going to be sending out anything to the press long before they bothered to contact the retailers that they are obviously the primary drivers of their business. Um, 
I talk about the the struggles with trying to protect employees and, you know, obviously not lose them, but also make sure they still have a paycheck in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> talk about freezing books, um, about how there's been issues with Diamond as the sole proprietary <laughs> distributor for most comics and how it's when they stop, basically everything stops and there's no way to work around it. It's a it's a really good deep dive. Definitely check it out. Again, by Vanita Rogers on newsarama.com. Really good article. I'll post it in the description as well. Um, but it, it obviously generates a lot of thought for the topic that we had last week. Um, what does this mean for the comic book industry going forward? Is this the end of physical mediums? You know, a lot of people are fearful that it will be. Now, there's obviously several things that have taken action to prevent this a little bit. Which leads into some of the, the other news items. The next one is that Vault Comics, I believe. Let me just make sure. Yeah. The next one is that Vault Comics is offering free digital number ones when you buy a gift card from your local comic book shop. So it's just a little incentive program trying to help out their local retailers Basically, if you call, email, reach out to your comic book uh, shops and ask them if you can purchase a gift card of any amount, you take proof of that purchase and you send it into Vault, and then they will send you uh, a pre-release digital free copy of Heavy Number 1 and 100 Wolves Number 1, which are two of their big upcoming books that you can look forward to. So it's just like a little way that they're trying to reach out and help people out, um, which is awesome. I love to see it. Uh, other distributors have been doing you know, other things to try to help people out in other ways. Obviously, the biggest one is allowing for cancellations of you know pull customers' orders and stuff like that. Obviously, it's a big strain when you have to put in your pulls, you know, several yeah. months before they they come out and just hope that they arrive on time that there won't be any issues so obviously this is a big concern when you get hit with a pandemic yeah and all of your polls are now currently screwed and nobody's going to be able to pick them up much less be able to receive them because n while you used to be able to mail them out now that diamond's not distributing them now you can't even mail them out because they're not coming to the shops yeah that is uh, one of the unfortunate truths about this whole thing is that it has revealed the weakness, or weaknesses, weaknesses of relying on a single form of distribution, and that isn't for like any reason other than like Diamond was the only one in business doing that because Diamond was literally the only one in business. Like, there weren't any other distributors on that level for a multitude of reasons, one of which probably being the uh, profitability or a lack thereof of engaging in this kind of business nowadays. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of those, as I've said before, it's kind of one of those grandfather industries that, you know, as people drop, uh, there's nobody stepping up to replace them. The reason being is because they don't see a future potential profit in there for them you know right why start up all these business costs for a brand new business if you think the industry is dying and switching to another medium altogether yeah. so from that perspective i understand again i understand diamonds reasoning uh, obviously they could improve their communication a little bit and obviously give people more of a heads up so they can brace themselves but again i don't blame them obviously you know no business wants to be sitting on week after week after week after week of product that's supposed to go around to the entire country perhaps you know several countries and not be able to do anything with it and risk it obviously degrading getting damaged and whatever the case is you know being lost you You're know just this we're running talking, out of room we're talking massive um, quantities of these books you know there's just only so much you can do so i don't necessarily put diamond at fault for this but obviously there's downsides um a, a lot of the comic book creators have s s kind of looked around for other options to distribute in particular regional markets so it's a much more small scale type of thing 
which is a lot more logistically intensive because you have to make contracts with each individual regions, you know, proprietary distributors and then try to make deals with them to make deals with these retailers to get them out to the retailers and keep the comic business alive. Some companies have just stopped altogether. Valiant's one of them where they're just not sending books out altogether. I think based on the quotes, I didn't really think this would be the right answer, but the more I think about it, the more I think it's true. I think uh, the gentleman that was quoted, I think from Alaska had the right idea that perhaps they should just stop releasing the books, both digitally and physically until this is all over and then resume your printing and everything. And I think that would be fine because it allows creators to do what we always talk about and get stuff done ahead of time and have a clear, coherent right. story, uh, clearly drawn, clearly written, all ahead of time. Nothing's being rushed or forced or you know reacted to and changed on the fly. So that works for me. Yeah. Uh, the reason being because you know if you keep rele- releasing these digital issues, once the retailers finally get all of these said issues, they're going to be sitting on piles and piles of these books that are already several months outdated and that they can't sell you know unless they have very specific collectible value which they may or may not yeah i mean that is it's a complicated issue and there's so many so many issues tied direct directly to how the financial aspect of this entire uh this entire art form works yeah, and it's because of that that uh, if they continue to release things and go like completely digitally, I would predict that not only would it hurt your local comic book shop, but it would hurt the comic book creator companies, specifically Marvel and DC. Because if I've learned anything from uh, the days of uh, people very quietly talking about sailing the high seas is that once it goes digital it, it's it's free forever yeah it's as an avid collector and fan it's really hard for me <laughs> to think about a world without the physical medium and i really really genuinely hope it's not the case clearly you know uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention to our social medias, uh, we recently used your Patreon funds. Again, thank you to Heather Reap, who's continued to be an executive producer of the show, um, along with several other contributors, past contributors. So we contributed some money using our Patreon funds to one of our local comic book shops that we love very much that uh, had a GoFundMe from a fan, not from them themselves, to help them pay for their employees for the next couple of weeks. Cause basically with Ohio's government shutting everything down until mid April, basically they have no income to pay said employees and keep them, you know, obviously yeah. paying their bills and keeping them fed. Even, like e- even being able to not afford, lo- afford the rent. Yeah. Just for the shop, like where it's located. Yeah, I mean, screw the business. <laughs> like if the business has to shut down, so be it. But what do, you, what do you do with all these people that you know, rely on you for their source of income and that have been very loyal to you? Many of them creators themselves that have given your shop great name and great advertising, you know, with their work. Um, and we love them to death and we contributed to their fundraising goal and they met their goal very quickly, which is great to see. Obviously, the fans care and the, yeah. their customers care. They're a very good shop. However, I th- if this goes further and they're talking about this pandemic peaking for our area, you know, as late as, you know, early June, late May, I don't think that the funds they raise are going to be enough to pay all of these people for that period of time. Maybe they can start another GoFundMe, but at that point, who's paying attention, you know? Right. Um. So, yes, I, I worry about them very much. I worry about all of the comic shops because all of them were basically doing some sort of mail to customer work to try to keep money in the coffers, to keep the lights on or whatever else, you know, make sure that they could <laughs> reopen their business once this is all blown over. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, th- it doesn't look like that's going to be the case now that Diamond's shutting down distribution. And many of these publishers are not seeking out another methods. And a few of the publishers are still going to be releasing digital forms of their comics, which is terrible for these retailers because now when they finally do get caught up when they finally do get a chance to get back on their feet they're going to have tons of these just completely worthless comics you know for their customer base because their customer base wants the most recent thing especially the most avid fans that are probably their primary um supporters and uh it's it's just a terrible situation all around and i i'm sure they can get by a little bit by posting old issues and collectible issues on the internet and trying to sell them via ebay or something like that but there's only so much you can do and a lot of these stores don't necessarily have the infrastructure to put every book you know on ebay or whatever the case is you know they'll have to figure it out real quick i think this is really going to test the retailer industry who's who's got the flexibility to adapt and who doesn't and it's ruthless and it sucks and it's terrible and i think Like a lot of businesses, we're going to see a lot of stores closing down across the country. And I really hope that's not the case, but it seems inevitable at this point. Yeah, it's... uh, It's very rare that every industry in a civilization is put through a very difficult stress test where you are forced to either adapt or die and the comic book industry as inherently fragile as it was at least for like the last few decades especially since the 90s um i find it like while i do have hope for all of these uh brick and mortar mom and pop shops i find it very hard to believe that even a sizable amount of these shops will be able to last until like early June with like no distribution coming their way. That's uh, like the only thing that I could foresee as far as them like trying to maintain just the money to keep, uh, just to keep them running would be if they were to somehow some way Basically sell themselves and all of their stuff to the point where they don't have anything else coming in just to make it that far. Yeah. And I find it very unlikely that, one, they would even accept doing that as a thing. And two, that even if they were to accept that, that that would work. Because that is, one a stupid amount of product to try to push in just a couple of months. Yeah. And, and like the cuts that you would have to make to the price in order for that to even be viable, let alone desirable for a massive amount of people. I mean, while it's possible, I find it very unlikely. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's a shit show. No matter which way you look <laughs> at it, it's, you know, th- it's been three weeks of this. Where we're basically just depressing you all out there with the news. Um, yeah these are depressing times we promise we have a much more light-hearted topic of the show this week to kind of lighten things up a little <laughs> bit and remember go watch batman 1966 to get ready for the next episode of comic movie or comic movie master list yeah yeah that's... almost forgot my own title there yeah that's uh again go watch that movie it'll cheer you up if for no other reason it, than the it, trailer alone cheered us up yeah we were it, rolling laughing it is quite <laughs> possibly the most ridiculous and fun thing that I've watched in like maybe the last three weeks. Yeah. So <laughs> definitely look at that. Well, it'll be coming next week for sure. Yeah. But you know, there's, there's things out there to kind of distract you from the depressing realities that uh, are currently in place and progressing. So on that, let's go ahead and move on to more depressing news. <laughs> However, this week's Delay Corner only has one one issue to worry about. So, Delay Corner, we have it every week, basically, because comic companies can't figure out their schedules. And this time, they kind of have a, an excuse, so I don't blame them, necessarily. Yeah. Champions number two has been postponed three weeks, as announced. 
Uh, now, again, this is complicated even further by Diamond's not distributing anything post April 1st, which you got to wonder, is that an April Fool's joke at a very inappropriate time? Uh, here's an April Fool's joke. <laughs> um, are we sure champions being delayed is depressing news? <laughs> I'm sure it has fans. Are you? I don't. <laughs> You're the Marvel guy. I don't know. <laughs> like, I just, I'm just saying. It's the. It's a reboot. It's issue number two. A- another. Maybe it's good. You an- don't know. If I can, another one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's now estimated for a May 27th release date. Again, who the fuck knows if that's going to happen because we don't know what's going on between the distributors, between the publishers, between the retailers. It's all very convoluted. That's, uh, again, making a huge assumption as to what even the purchasing landscape is going to look like, considering that, again, uh, COVID-19's predictions for peaking being so far out into May that people are thinking it might actually be June. Yeah, so... It's concerning. We'll see what happens, but it's, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, keep your ears to the ground or, you know, come to us and we'll do it for you. Yeah. I can't really get on the creators or Marvel that much on this one just because of the situation, but it sucks to see. There is a delay on that book. If you were looking forward to it, it won't be out for another three weeks after its initial release date. So that wraps up the news. In these trying times, it behooves us to ask the question as carefully as we possibly can with absolutely no intention of making a joke about this at all. What books are we, with washed hands and sterile gloves and hopefully M85 masks, are we carefully hitting up this week? Well, Emery, I carefully thought you'd never ask. And please don't spit when you talk. I make no promises. <laughs> so, again, we have switched to a new format for sharing the issues with you if you're on the YouTube channel. Again, haven't heard any complaints. It seems like people like it, so we're going to keep doing it. Um, if you are listening, not going to benefit you at all. But, hey, you know, the YouTube video is there for you if you want to take advantage of that. You could always watch us on YouTube. So we always get these uh, new solicitations from FreshComics.us, which is a great, great, wonderful resource if you really want to see what's coming to your local comic book shops. Again, please, however you can, support your local comic book shops. And digital devices, of course. Uh, This is solicitations for April 1st release date. April Fool's, haha. Uh, April Fool's. Coronavirus was a, a lie from the government. Yeah, April Fools. Uh, yeah, ah. yeah, go outside. It's perfectly fine. Uh, yeah, the, 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 again, that was for anyone listening. That was a joke. Do not, for the love of God, Alex Jones uh, is losing his shit right now. Oh, I'm sure he is. Uh, do not, for the love of God, uh, risk yourself in any unnecessary way, or even worse, get the police to think that you are somehow being careless with your life and the lives of others if you don't have to be by going outside. Yeah, please don't. So, uh, first up, from Dynamite Entertainment, we have 150 variant covers, like always, which are completely worthless now that they're not being distributed. So, Because you can just look at them online. It's like, oh, that one's that, a little different. That four-inch square is cool, I guess. Uh, just like this other four-inch square is cool i guess oh look boobs that that's neat i can just look at all of these variants and not have to you know collect or pay money for these or see them in a size that warrants (laughs) (laughs) wanting to look at them in the first place or make any kind of collectible out of these things so first up we have nancy drew and the hardy boys the dance the the dance the death of nancy drew number one need to learn to read (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Next up, we have Red Sonia number 15. And of course, there's going to be a million boob and booty variants because that's what Dynamite does best. I we mean, l- it's Red Sonia. They make it so easy. We love you, Dynamite. You just, you're just a little extra sometimes. 
maybe reconsider having Red Sonia do Spider-Man poses. <laughs> because it could just be that she's uh, about to pee. Next up, we have The Boys, Dear Becky, number one. Oh, my God. <laughs> they picked a hell of a time to do a number one for The Boys. Sure did. <laughs> we have The Death Defying Devil, number five. Or, as I like to call him, totally not uh, Daredevil Boomerang Man. <laughs> <laughs> totally not. <laughs> it is curious. We have Vengeance of Vampirella, number seven, because, you know, why not? Because someone did her wrong. And then 100 half-naked variants, because that's what we do with Vampirella. Yeah, I don't know how it's possible to do Vampirella wrong, but someone did. Next she's up. She's going to have her vengeance. <laughs> sure will. <laughs> with her vampiric alien planet brethren. Next up from Marvel Comics, we have Ant-Man number four. We have Avengers of the Wastelands, number four. Huh. We have Black Cat, number 11. We Didn't have... know she had her own. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Uh, we have Black Panther and the Agents of Wakanda, number eight. We have Black Widow, number one. Terrible time for a premiere. Sorry. Black Cat, Black Panther, Black Widow? Obviously, they were trying to preach to the movie crowd but uh now that the movie's not coming out anytime soon i i will say this if they somehow manage to fit in black cat into one of the spider-man movies oh my god <laughs> <laughs> black cat is so useless though <laughs> her only purpose in life is to show boobs to spider-man and look good and leather and that is a purpose well served by both her and her <laughs> protege not her protege, her predecessor, Catwoman. Ugh. There was a reason why those characters were made. And it's to look hot in a leather getup. Come on. At least Catwoman does stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Black Cat doesn't do anything. Yeah, she does. What does she do? She, she practically does the same thing as Catwoman. Uh, she's a thief. Uh, she's just very... L- <laughs> she's she's just terribly underplayed. Hey, sugar. It, it's almost like... We kind of see that we might have taken an idea and uh, not so originally made it our own. <laughs> yeah, definitely not original. <laughs> when you have the same word in the title of your character, <laughs> you did not even try. <laughs> it's like, what's different about Black Cat? She has white hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's it. That's literally it. <laughs> so the black cat is different from Catwoman because she has white hair. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you doing? We have to make a color contrast. Her name is Leather Cat. <laughs> shiny Leather Cat. Uh, so, yeah, th- th- give me the shiny Leather Cat. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Daredevil number 20. Very cool cover. We have Deadpool number five. We have Doctor Doom number seven. We, we have Doctor Strange, number five. We have Empire Avengers, number zero, although that's in that, question. That's another... Uh, it's another event. Yep. It's another event. And we have Empire Fantastic Four, number zero. Again, it's uh, questionable whether that's coming out at all. Yeah, we're, we're all waiting. We have Excalibur, number 10. We have Marauders, number 10. We have Miles Morales, Spider-Man, number 17. We have Spider-Man Noir, number two. We have Star Wars, Dr. Afra number one. For you fucking nerds. Another Dr. Afra number one? Yeah, I don't know why she needs rebooted, because she's a new character. Did they... Oh, my God. <laughs> we have Strange Academy, number two. Because that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's what we need for Doctor Strange, for him to have his own fucking heart, Hogwarts. Yeah, Hogwarts for <laughs> Marvel. DC had their own for a little while there. You know, whatever. I'm just going to say it right now. Uh, Marvel already had Hogwarts. It's called the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we already but now did we this. Have magic. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Strike Force number eight. We have Swordmaster number ten. We have Taskmaster number one. Again, probably for the movie that's not coming out now. Oof. 
We have. Unless you have Disney Plus. Yeah. Are they streaming it? I think they, they that might be a thing that's happening. Really? Mm. I hadn't heard that. Mm. Gonna have to dig deeper. Mm. Did you triple source? Uh, Did you triple source, Emery? I only doubled. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, uh, we have The Magnificent Miss Marvel, number 14. M- we Magnificent, we say. We that, have, is, that is a bold claim. <laughs> we have so salty, man. Jeez, look, I can't just, get through the Marvel segment ever without you just throwing shade left and right, can we? That's because they keep throwing salt my way. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna make me eat it, then I'm gonna let them know how the food was. I'm gonna find you dried up on the side of the road one day. <sighs> That's what salt does to you. <laughs> it's true. I'm using you to thaw the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have X Men: God Loves, A Man Kills. Number one, the Whoa. extended cut. So. Ex- extended cut. <laughs> extended cut. How, what? Well, what the hell needs to be added to that story? Something apparently. Oh my god! Look forward to it, please. <sighs> please clap. They better not fuck up. <laughs> Next up from DC Comics, we have Batman number ninety-two. We have Daphne Byrne number four. Ooh, black label. We have Freedom Fighters Rise of a Nation, which I'm guessing is a one-off. Gotham High, which is, you know, we'll see. Again, <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's coming out, but it had a pretty ridiculous trailer. <laughs> yes, it did. But it seems like it could have some Archie-like audience appeal. Because that's what we want from Batman. Next up, we have Harley Quinn, number 72. We have Justice League, number 44. We have Justice League Odyssey, number 20. We have Lois Lane, number 10, black label oh, book that's there. The, oh, my God. Might have to investigate. Lois Lane has a black label book? She sure does. Oh, my God. Not a black couch book. Get I, it straight. I this am, isn't dynamite. Calm down. I I am now curious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might actually pick up a book just titled Lois Lane. <laughs> Why not? I, I, She's if, doing some deep dive investigative journalism, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there's quite a few deep dives that she's making. Whoa. <laughs> Saucy. Spicy. <laughs> Next up, we have Metal Men, number six. They did bring the Metal Men back again, which it, it, they made a big deal about it in the New 52, which is, you know, it was good. Uh, it was just, fine. Yeah, just yeah, do something with them. Just, don't just, you know, pop them up every now and again. Just, you know. Do something with them. Next up, we have Strange Adventures, number two. We have mm. The Dreaming, number 20, from the Sandman universe, of course. And we have Genlock, number six. Oh, that belongs on Weeb Corner. <laughs> it looks good, though. I it might, it I might does. Pick, I need to pick it up. Next up, from IDW Publishing, we have Cobra Kai, The Karate Kid Saga Continues, number four. He's the best around. <laughs> we have Disney Comics and Stories, number 12. We have Dungeons and Dragons, Infernal Tides for Emery Nerds, number three. What the? Ho- hold on just for, a fucking you, minute here. Fucking Emery themed nerds. You, you <laughs> fucking listen here. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking nerd. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons is amazing. <laughs> Not and, what I heard. I mean, now it kind of sucks because, you know, social distancing. <laughs> can you can you Skype? <laughs> can you be a <laughs> Skype dungeon leader? Uh yeah, but that it kind of loses the entire point of <laughs> the original point of D and D was getting together at a fucking table. Yeah, so now go, we're, no, go enjoy that, fucking nerds. It's we're, fine. Oh, skyping in like we're fucking that dark council meeting Nick Fury or some bullshit. Yeah, use holograms. God, we're not there yet. Next up, we have GI Joe, a real American hero, number two seventy one. Fun fact for you: the GI Joe cartoon series is now available free of charge to stream if you so choose. America. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, go and watch a real American hero if you so choose. A real American hero. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these people with nostalgia saying, "Go watch it." It's it, if you want a good laugh, it's good. <laughs> it's so over the top and ridiculous. But, uh, you know, whatever. Pork chop sandwiches! <laughs> Next up, we have Marvel Action Avengers number 10. We have Marvel Action Captain Marvel number 5. What the fuck? 
We have Mountainhead number four. What the fuck? <laughs> we have Ragnarok, The Breaking of Helheim, number five. What the fuck? <laughs> Calm down. Jeez. The... <laughs> Dropping F-bombs left and right. What the... He- what are these titles? We have... <laughs> <laughs> Ragnarok looks fine. I, I mean, it, it's a pretty metal cover, but... It's pretty metal. Why the hell have I not heard of these? Uh, we definitely read Ragnarok on the show a few times. Are you sure? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I'll, I'll take your word. Star Wars Adventures, The Clone Wars, number one, because that's exactly what we want to dive into again. More clones. <laughs> Those are always a good idea. Next up, we have <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Urban Legends, number 23. And that wraps up IDW. From Image Comics, we have 20XX, number four. The fuck is this? The opening crawl to Mega Man? We have Birthright, number 43. We have Cobra, number six. I almost read that as Cobra. I wanted it to be Cobra. <laughs> that might actually make it more interesting. We have Exor Sisters, number six. I see what they did there. We have Nailbiter Returns. <gasps> what? Number one. Oh, my God. So I'm going to have to dive back into that because I have... The signed nail biter number one on my wall, which I love very much, and I got to talk to the creators uh, about their uh, plans for the story. It's very cool, very cool, very good book. Is, is he just against clipping his nails? I, I, I have so many questions. <laughs> Read the book; it's good. It's worth it. Okay. I uh, don't know why he would be returning, so that's kind of interesting. But we'll see what happens. Hmm. Next up, we have Outcast number forty-five. We have Savage Dragon, number 248. Ooh. We have The Ludocrats, number one. And that wraps up Image. From Archie Comics, we have Cosmo, The Mighty Martian, number five. We have Sabrina, Something Wicked, number one, which I am totally about this new reboot of Sabrina, The Teenage Witch. So It's, it's so much better. By all means, continue. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Dark Horse Comics. And we have Kill Whitey Donovan, number five. We have Spy Island, number one. Spyland. <laughs> Let's see here. And that's it for Dark Horse. From Titan Books, we have Doctor Who, the 13th Doctor, season two, number four. <sighs> <It's a mouthful. laughs> it sounds exhausting just reading the title. Then we have Sherlock, a scandal in <laughs> Belgravia, number five. Much more manageable. Thank you. Much more. Uh... Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, let's see here. From Boom Studios, we have Buffy the Vampire Slayer, number 14. From Oni Press, we have Rogue Planet, number one. From Vault Comics, again, take advantage of that gift card deal where they'll send you two uh, f- free digital copies of their upcoming number ones. You got Finger Guns, number two. Bonk. We have Sarah and the Royal Stars, number seven. Bong. I'm just going to start reading them because I think it's cool. Yeah. AWA is Artists, Writers, and Artisans. We have Year Zero, number one. They they have really cool looking covers every week, so I'm going to start reading their books. We'll yeah. see. We'll see how good it is. Hopefully it's good. Looks really good. See if the content matches those drapes. And that wraps up all the releases coming to your local comic book shops or not. Again, however you can in these trying times, please support your local comic book shops. And digital devices this week. Again, assuming they come to digital devices. It's a lot of assuming we're doing. It's very uncertain. Don't really know. So these are, these are wild times that we're living in right now. We're going to keep bringing you the news and the new releases when we can. But again, take everything with a heavy, heavy grain of salt because we don't fucking know <laughs> because nobody's communicating what they need to communicate. And it's because nobody knows what the future holds and nobody, the government guidelines keep changing day to day, literally, literally day by day. So it's just, there's nothing they can do. Uh, yeah, that- hands are tied everywhere. So we're just going to have to be flexible. That heavy grain of salt slowly turning into something the size of a jawbreaker at this point. Yeah. Now it's time to hand out the prestigious Nay Life-Changing Awards 
of cover and variant cover of the week <gasps> from Hit the Books Podcast. First up, from AWA, the newcomer on the block. AWA. We have Year Zero, number one. This cover done by Carrie Andrews, who has won the prestigious award in the past, I believe. So this book uh, has a very nature-esque, naturalistic, very cool, impressive cover featuring a lot of great nature art. It's like if Bob Ross was good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, uh, that's, a, that's a happy little mountain in the background. <laughs> it's a very nice little happy camping grounds with zombie killer written across the sides of a very up armored uh rv there looks very interesting looks like it could be the the new zombie book to read by all means go out and pick it up i really love the aesthetic i like the light through the mountains again very naturalistic very impressive uh you know i before i see the rv at the bottom honestly i thought it was a picture when we were scrolling through, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. They just used a picture of nature. And then I looked at the bottom, like, nope, that's a drawing. That is artwork. Yeah. Very cool. Very realistic. Very mm. impressive. Incredibly well done. I mean, I'm curious, you know, how well drawn the interior is and how well illustrated the interior is. But it is a very cool and impressive cover. Very impressed. Great job, Carrie Andrews. That is very impressive. Um, did you have anything to add on that? I find it very interesting uh, the well the setting that they chose for this uh, specifically on the cover. Uh, what it looks like is well they're on a fishing trip. <laughs> they're on a fishing trip in what I'm assuming is the zombie apocalypse. And my biggest question is I re I, like I hope the zombie virus or infection or whatever the hell they're going to explain away zombies with is in this world hasn't spread to all the other wildlife. Yeah. Because that'd be terrible. Um, the I mean, composition of this, though, it's very, it's very interesting because it does very much look like a picture more than half the way down. And then once you get to the zombie killer RV and the, the benches and the, the reflection in the water. It's um, very picturesque, but also surreal, given what we can only assume is going to be, or at least I'm assuming, that this is some kind of road trip at the end of the world adventure, kind of a zombie land style. Yeah, could be. Yeah, it's it seems like it's going to be a little bit heavy. According to the description in here, um, probably less comedic like Zombie Land, <laughs> but uh, yeah, really impressive cover nonetheless. I mean, logically, if something like that did go down, you would want to go to one of the least populated places you could, particularly ones that were heavy with terrain obstacles that would prevent zombies from getting over said obstacles and getting to you without being trampled to death or mauled by animals or fallen off a cliff or, you know, drowning or whatever the case is, you know, the harsher the weather, the better, <laughs> you know, if they freeze to death and, you know, get stuck in the, the winter, great, perfect, yeah. you know, but again, it just depends on your zombie cannon, I suppose, what's practical and what's not, and then there's always the challenge of can you survive in said environment easily enough? If you can't raid a convenience store once in a while for supplies, you know, because it's so remote. So there's ups and downs, but I, I would say it's the logical choice to go to somewhere remote. Um, if you play The Last of Us, there's a section where they're in Wyoming, which I think is a very obvious, you know, place to go mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're able, because it is pretty remote. There's a lot of remote terrain, very mountainous terrain, not a ton of people. So you can probably survive A-OK. -okay, probably. As, as long as the people aren't trying to kill you. Right. One of the common questions about the uh, zombie apocalypse is, who should you really be worried about? It's fair, dog. And given the cast that they are 
advertising that's going to be making up the main characters. I can only wonder as to who is going to be the real threat. <laughs> yep, it sounds like the group themselves are <laughs> are going to be the real threat. Yeah. Based on the description here. A Japanese hitman, a Mexican street urchin, an Afghan military aide, a polar research scientist, and a Midwestern survivalist. Who will stand tall? Sounds like a game show. All I'm right. just curious as to how they plan on getting all of these characters together in one area, let alone be on like a team with each other. It was yeah. like I'd... I have so many questions about this book. I want to read it. So, AWA, I don't know if you have physical books coming out or not. I'll have to do some more research and get back to the fans on that. Sorry. Yeah. I wish I was more knowledgeable about them because it is a newcomer on the block. But every book that they've released you know, on the weekly basis have has looked pretty interesting. So, I'm going to start picking up these books, especially since they're all number ones. See how they are. Give them some support. And if you're out there and you're interested, I highly recommend you do, especially with this cover done by Carrie Andrews. So congratulations once again for winning the cover of the week. Next up, the prestigious, nay life-changing award of variant cover of the week goes to Batman number 92, the cardstock art germ cover. This one featuring the latest Joker girlfriend punchline. First we had Harley, who, (laughs) who was made on the TV show. (laughs) <laughs> the animated TV show. Yeah, the animated and series then, is literally the birthplace of Harley Quinn. She was supposed to be a throwaway character, and then people liked her so much, they just made her canon. And just something then, about her. Then in the New 52, they tried this thing with what they called Joker's Daughter, which was just this idiot that pretended she was Joker's daughter. Yeah, it was like it, she was a dent. But she was also like she's literally kind the of daughter a girlfriend, and it was just it, it didn't make any fucking sense. Yeah, it was so fucking weird. Like Until, her name was Duella Dent. Like how how do we go with that and say I am the daughter of the Joker? Somehow, I guess it was stupid. Yeah, and then that evolved and then died. Um, and now we have the latest iteration. I am not caught up on the Batman canon. So forgive me, I don't know what the source of this is. I really don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it could be good, it could be bad, but it always seems bad when this happens. And it has been in the past, so we'll see. But apparently this is somehow, some way, whether she's claiming to or whether she actually is in some way, shape, or form, linked with Joker and basically has nothing to do with this cover so the cover itself is awesome so the cover has a a huge blast of color a lot of variation um i can't tell for sure but it looks like there's some like japanese script at the very top on the background that is what that looks like it sure seems like it so I'm, i'm assuming that this character is japanese in some way shape or form uh or at least they're implying this um very cool cover just very vivid and it's striking. Obviously, it catches your eye as you're going through the new covers uh, for the week. Um, very cool variant cover. I I wish I had more context for the character to say whether I like the character themselves or not. She could be awesome. It, she obviously doesn't mind stabbing people. As we know, she stabbed Harley Quinn. That was in the one of our news articles there. Yeah. So that was kind of spoiled for us. But... Um, Obviously, some kind of force to be reckoned with, and also a fan of knives, much like the Joker himself. So, we'll see what uh, the context is for this. We'll have to dig in a little bit deeper. But, again, very cool, very striking cover. Um, Awesome artist aesthetic. You know, not too overly sexualized, although it is somewhat sexualized. Really like what they're doing with the color uh, dynamics, with the kind of orange uh, logo kind of wrapped around her with the obviously more blue and green aesthetic with the Joker kind of imprint in the bottom left corner there. Very cool, very subtle. I like how, again, it's one of those covers, the more you look at it, the more you pull from it, the more you notice. Um, Yeah. So there's a lot of fine detail if you look closely enough. Um, This cover done by Stanley Lau. I don't know if I said that earlier or not. Um, But when you hear the art germ, it's usually Stanley Lau. So um, very, very cool. Uh, 
very awesome, very vivid, very striking cover that hopefully is at your comic book shops and can be mailed to you. If not, um, definitely go and seek it out. I, I'm definitely going to collect it. I think it's a cool cover. Hopefully the character is as cool as the, the artwork and the design is because it's a very cool, striking uh, design. And I really hope this is a very cool design. <laughs> I really hope it's not like the Joker's daughter thing, which was not a very good design. It was also not a very cool character or likable character or interesting character. So that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's other people that feel differently. But for me, it wasn't really my jam. Yeah, I I I, I can't stop looking at this cover. It's cover. It's striking, and it's bold, and it's colorful, and it just makes me ask more questions. More questions is always good, especially when those questions are, who is this person? Why haven't I heard about them? I really want to know about them. What's their deal? Um, And then all of the, the details that come from that, they're... The X and the O on her gloves. I have questions as to like what what are those about? Uh, I mean the Joker face Hugs and on... kisses. <laughs> 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 That's the joke. Uh, that or she's hitting you tic tac toe style. Um, and then just the not quite. I was gonna say Dutch angle, but the the angle is so scant that it just it has the whole thing going sideways, and not like the character. Um, the Japanese script on the top also makes you want to ask: It's like, okay, is this person of Asian descent? Because I mean, they're kind of getting that vibe a little bit, and just the. The style of dress that they've given this character for this cover is very, is very striking. It, like it kind of reminds me of uh, Sega Genesis game uh, Streets of Rage. <laughs> <laughs> for the third week in a row, we for, found a reason to mention Streets of Rage. For the third, it, it's a good game. <laughs> And the fourth one is going to be coming out at some point. The fourth one is going to be coming out. There's no reason (laughs) that this game should have come up three weeks in a row. Okay. Uh. There's no reason, naturally, but it keeps being given at least to me. (laughs) Like, she looks like the kind of... The kind of baddie that you would beat up in a a side-scrolling (laughs) beat-em-up. So now you're supporting violence against women now, Emery. Jeez. Okay, first of all... I never thought it would the day. First of all, how dare you? Second of all... <laughs> <laughs> violence in any form should always be equal opportunity. <laughs> Damn, son. <laughs> like, if you had... Emery just told all the women to get wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm saying if women are going to be playing the role of villains, they ought to be willing to take a punch from a hero. Yeah, probably. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, this this person's already stabbed Harley. (laughs) It's true. Uh, Like, I'm just saying, and she looks formidable. She does look formidable, which is more than I can say about the Joker's daughter. Oh, yes. Whoever this character is, you know, Punch, like, punchline looks far more formidable than previous attempts at replacing Harley yeah. as the Joker's may or may not be love interest. We'll see how it evolves, though. I'm I'm interested for sure. Yeah, she's got the look. <laughs> that kill. Or at the very least, a look that stabs you in your ex-girlfriend. Whoa. <laughs> Spicy. Oh, well. Spicy. So, with that being said, the cover itself, beyond the character, is very awesome. So, Stanley Lau, great job. Really love the cover. Very cool. Very aesthetic. Obviously, very uh, eye candy like <laughs> design with all the beautiful yeah. colors implemented it, into the design. The colors and the angles and this, the. 
Just the composition of this whole thing in general is very... It, like, it doesn't just ask for your attention. It demands your attention. It does. And it serves its purpose, because I'm going to freaking read the book to oh, figure yeah. out who she is and what's going on. It, th- this is exactly what a comic book cover is supposed to do. And again, this is written by James Tinian, which... I like James Tinney in the fourth. I think he makes really solid, great books, and he he very consistently makes good stuff. You know, I wouldn't put him in like the the top tier echelon of people that have made incredible stories, but usually the people in those top tier echelons they tend to not be consistent. <laughs> right, they tend to drop off a cliff at some point, that, that and it's very disappointing and, and tragic for comic <laughs> fans because you're like, ah, oh, I thought you were the cornerstone. <laughs> Um, we had that hope for Tom King. But it's guys like James Tinney and the fourth that make really great books and consistently put out great books. Now, there's exceptions, of course, that are just phenomenal. You know, I don't want to belittle James Tinian. He's a great, great writer. Really love his work. He wrote Nightwing for a while, that I, and I really enjoyed his run. Yeah. So just thought I'd put that out there. Uh, but again, congratulations to Stanley Lau for winning the prestigious Nay Life Changing Award of Variants of the Week. And I get that cover. So, without further ado, let's jump into the topic of the week. Emery, what is our topic? This is a topic that I had hoped and prayed would never come to pass again. (gasps) The topic we're talking about is a Marvel DC crossover. The likes of which have not been done since the 90s. The Amalgamverse? <sighs> Ooh. <laughs> if you want there to be any sort of universe where you get a vaguely uh, Metropolis Kid-esque Superboy-styled spider child that shoots his web out of a gun... This might be the thing for you. If you want some weird bastardized mismatch called Dark Claw, who's a combination of Batman and Wolverine, obviously, then this might be up your alley. But if you think that the mixing and the matching and the meshing of these characters from these separate companies is a bad idea. Well, too bad you're probably in for it anyway. When it comes to this whole thing, I am vehemently opposed to it. See, I'm okay with it. Oh, really? Yeah. So It's not like there's... You're okay with... Redundancy on top of redundancy on top of redundancy. It's comics. They're stupid. You're taking it too personally. Look, I'm just saying. So the the reason we bring this up <laughs> as a topic of the show is because several creators have been kind of championing this championing, championing. Uh, championing. English. Yes. I can do it. English. Do you speak it? Barely. <laughs> but... um. Several creators, including the likes of Gail Simone, who I really love, have been kind of jumping on board with a lot of these fans that are clamoring for an updated kind of crossover attempt between Marvel and DC, the big two, of course. This has been done before, as we were jokingly talking about right there. Uh, The reason I am not so hard on it is because it can't possibly be worse than what's currently in a lot of these books, in my opinion. Uh, uh, I mean, you look at the likes of New Warriors, which is coming up, and you're like, that's the best you could do? Yikes. I'd rather you just (laughs) try to merge these characters and get new stories. Um, Mm. Now, that being said, the Amalgamverse was ridiculous. The reason was because they just did it so poorly. And I don't think it has to be done poorly. We've seen plenty of crossovers <clears throat> in recent history, especially on IDW's side, where IDW had Batman and the Mut- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it was a fun book. It was a good book. It, it worked. It was fine. 
there's nothing wrong with it, and that would technically be a crossover universe book. They've been doing a lot of Marvel books recently where they're crossing over with Marvel characters and in the IDW lines, and they're fine. They're you know, it's nothing to write home about, but it's it's enjoyable, it's fine. There's no reason not to. I think it can be done if done properly. Now, do we trust the creators working within said companies to do it say properly? Uh, probably not, <laughs> but my answer is absolutely not. <laughs> I'm okay with them trying, uh, especially if it's specifically crossover and not amalgam verse style where we're <laughs> merging characters and <laughs> trying to find these convoluted, stupid ways to make them the same character when they are completely incompatible characters to begin with. Yeah. Um, so there's challenges obviously, but uh, it's part of creativity. I, you know, it's easy for us jaded comic book fans to say, hey, don't do that. Don't touch this. This is, you know, this is what's good. Why are you messing with it? But sometimes yeah, it's fun to push the envelope. It's fun to do something creative and, you know, see what happens. Now, again, there's exceptions. If you're going too far, your editor should probably step in and say, hey, that's probably not a good idea. This might damage the character, you know, right. at its core uh, and its fan base. So maybe let's adjust this, tweak this, kind of move in a slightly different direction. But I get how they don't want to necessarily just choke the creativity out of their their employees because then, you know, what's the point? They're going to leave the company and go somewhere that'll let them do their version of some kind of ideal, even if it's not necessarily with those pantheon of characters. So uh, I am totally okay with it it's been a long time since we've had some kind of significant crossover work between dc and marvel i think we're due if the companies are willing to come together and try something out i think it you know they're obviously very similar superheroes and pantheons of superheroes some of them being direct ripoffs of each other um so there's no reason why they can't kind of merge some stories together and have some (laughs) kind of crossover event they're each group is constantly rebooting their universes anyway and having these big universe shattering moments with crossovers within their own canon that doesn't make any fucking sense and with characters that are totally incompatible so it's not any stupider than what they're doing within their own canon so i'm totally for it why not there is one situation under which i would be okay with that and that would be if they were committed to fixing uh, what's wrong with the X-Men, because... I think you're it, asking too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just saying, if they were to cross over now, given where these characters are at now... It would probably not be ideal. I it, get it. It would, it would not be ideal. Superman... Superman would literally wipe the floor with every person who is now called Krakoa a home. Like, well, yeah, maybe. They kidnap children. They do they, kidnap children. <laughs> they keep but children from their parents. I think, you know, unless he got himself a Magneto helmet, they could do something to him. And again, it doesn't have to be a let's make our favorite superhero fight whatever other superhero so we can settle the bullshit debates. We already have a YouTube channel for that, and it's called Death Battle. And you can go watch that right now if you want to see Hulk versus Superman or Spider-Man versus Batman. It's all there. We already got our verdict. It's law. It's official. Go go check it out. <laughs> sure. From Screw Attack, I think, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Screw Attack. Which, I mean, they're basically the Death Battle channel at this point. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the only show that's really going. <laughs> yeah. I haven't uh, watched them in a while, though. I wonder if they're still going. Yeah. I think they kind of jumped the shark with uh, Superman versus Goku. Well, they Little. made they made Superman win, right? Spoilers. Uh, they made Superman win twice. I mean... <laughs> It's not a surprise. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, it's, it's not a modern... surprise to anyone who's a fan of like anything DC Comics related. I mean, to... I'm a huge Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT and Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Super and Dragon Ball and the... Kai. And there are lots of those people fan. who aren't very up on 
Superman. Well, quit being such a mark, all right? <laughs> just, just let it be. It's fine. <laughs> they're they're not real. <laughs> all right? But they make very compelling arguments. Like They for, do. For example, Superman can punch a hole in the fucking universe. So, you know. So can t- Shazam. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's like, <laughs> like Wednesday. Sh- Shazam could take out Goku. I'm going to say that right now. Yeah. Meanwhile, Goku's getting his ass kicked in every episode until the last minute where some bullshit escalation <laughs> happens and he's suddenly <laughs> some ungodly being uh, right. that can just barely be more powerful than whoever he's facing right now. So, I, I mean, to be fair... The tale of escalation. Yeah, the... It's a tale of escalation and ass pulls. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, you mean you can just now go ultra instinct because we're just now establishing that that's a thing. Okay, fucking whatever. Because we I ran guess. out of escalation points, so now we got to <laughs> escalate in another way. <laughs> like, we can't just have his hair get l- longer, more spiky more golden we now have to change his fucking hair color every goddamn time well you know damn well why they did it it's because they don't want to draw all that hair <laughs> that's why that's why legit it's why they don't make him go super suit three hardly ever oh yeah in the show because it's so hard on the animators oh. to draw all of that hair <laughs> and the individual little spikes all the way down his back yeah and that's that- probably why we've never seen vegeta go super saiyan 3 in a in a show or a movie because it was same reason hard enough for them to do it for goku we just assume he can because he's already proceeded way past super saiyan 3 so yeah what's the like, point <laughs> yeah we, it's like uh no we're not gonna make his hair get longer we're just gonna change color uh red blue White. Ray? <laughs> <laughs> so it's eh, whatever. Yeah. I mean, with Vegeta, when he escalated, all they did was make him a little bluer. <laughs> so it's like, you know, eventually you've escalated to the point where you have nowhere else to escalate. So uh, that's the I, I mean the whole Dragon Ball Z problem. I, I mean, there's always going to be escalation. It's like the only thing that you have to say for any Goku rival or challenge is that he can go just a little bit faster and a little bit stronger, and your hair is going to have to change another fucking mauve? <laughs> yeah. Rose? So I I thought it might <laughs> be a, I thought it might be a good thought experiment for the two of us to kind of run through maybe what if there is a crossover, what we'd like to see. We've talked about this in the past, so if any longtime fans, you, this might be familiar. Yeah. Obviously, we're trying to aim for something different than what we discussed before. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for crossovers. Um, one that pops to mind right away is Doctor Strange and um, John Constantine. I think that could be a really interesting dynamic where you got these kind of both very selfish, jaded individuals, one in it's a little more grand than the other. And uh, I think that could be a really cool kind of fun dynamic where they don't want to work together, but they have to for one common reason. And that I, way is an easy way to cross over universes because it's supernatural in nature anyway. God, they would be the magical lethal weapon. <laughs> they would be. And it would be <laughs> wonderful <laughs> if handled properly, of course. Uh, that's there's always a caveat, but yeah, like I I would be down for any kind of uh, crossover pairing where where I get to see Constantine, and I, I'm assuming in this case either Doctor Strange or hell maybe even Brother Voodoo to make it even more obvious that this is just Lethal Weapon. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, maybe have a storyline where Doctor Fate has disappeared. And he's desperately needed for some issue, you know, make up your stupid supernatural bullshit issue. Yeah, Dr. And Fate, for anyone who's wondering, is uh, the name given to anyone who wears a magical helmet. Yeah. So I'm thinking the traditional Dr. Fate. Where, yeah. You know, not the newest one that is like a young kid or whatever. I'm talking about the original Dr. Fate. Classic Dr. Fate. Say he disappears for some reason, and John Constantine has to get down to the bottom of it because something's threatening him directly because he, you know, he's selfish, so he's yeah, not going to bother yeah. unless it's affecting him directly. Of course. And then he's... That's why we love him. In some way, shape, or form, he ends up with Dr. Strange, and then they have to figure things out together. 
uh, to kind of write things because their universes are crossing over. And you can maybe even use this as the basis for all of the crossovers. Like, this is why it's happening, because... That John, would be the John, best way to do that. With Dr. Fate, MIA, and something terrible about to happen, John Constantine goes looking for him, but being selfish, screws something up, and ends up causing a big universe you know, clash, and then the crossovers start happening, and then the main storyline can circulate around John Constantine and Doctor Strange trying to figure things out, find a solution, and while you have several other, you know, crossover stories, you know, and they don't have to be fights or conflicts every freaking time, mm-hmm. like people always frame it. You can make it like a lot of the in canon crossover stories where they're just working together, you know. Or, you know, maybe these two personalities just clash, you know, for one reason or another. And they get, you know, for yeah some common interest, they got to work together and figure out a way to, you know, deal with each other without yeah. obviously trying to kill each other or whatever else. Although a clash once in a while is perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, keeping the the clashing of personalities and ideals to dialogue is not a bad move. Yeah. So... There's some big potential there. And I would say don't just go for like the big names if you don't have to. If you don't have a story for it, don't force it. You know, yeah. sure, people want to see it, but don't force it if there's not a story to be had there. You know, focus on characters that would have a story that at least a little bit kind of makes sense within the context, you know? Yeah. Uh, obviously, Doctor Strange and John Constantine, both, you know, magisters of supernatural magic and. Both everything have, else both have had to deal with the devil <laughs> exactly so makes sense you can have mephisto get involved if you need to uh you can get and lucifer have... get involved if you need to oh my god <laughs> so there's a lot of potential there so you know obviously that makes sense that they would in some way shape or form either clash or come together or work together or whatever the case is um you know other characters probably wouldn't make quite as much sense so if you look you know take like Edrigan and have him pair up with you know Ant Man. Be like, what? Why the <laughs> fuck is this happening? There's no reason for this to happen, and definitely don't merge them. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no! So, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. So, obviously, shoot for stuff that kind of makes a little bit of sense. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I mean, I could see where you have, you know, maybe like Winter Soldier pair up with Dick Grayson as the former sidekicks to the main you know icon yeah that sort of thing even though they're obviously very I, different characters or maybe even red hood red hood would probably work better as red a hood counterpart would work to winter soldier far better with the winter soldier yeah so you could have winter soldier and red hood kind of going at it and <laughs> maybe winter soldier as a more mature individual kind of helping red hood kind of get control of his anger and stuff throughout the issue and then he kind of grows as a character because of their interactions that would actually be kind of cool now that i think about it (laughs) yeah so i can see something like that work really well i mean there's there's tons of potential out there there's you know there's no but there's no reason why it couldn't work it just has to be done you know with care Yeah. yeah and that's the thing that worries me most is the potential carelessness that could come with something like this. Like, it would be wonderful if in this crossover we had characters like Wonder Woman having to work with the Scarlet Witch. Is like one is all like might and brawn and like physical force, while the other one is magic and reality warping and um, all of the banter and conflict and camaraderie that could possibly ensue from that. But I could also see them falling straight back into the Superman and Captain America are having to go back in time to fight Nazis together. (laughs) (laughs) Or something as careless as Batman showing up and having to Beat up everyone because that's what we like to do with Batman. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of stuff that we could do. Like you, could, you could have, you know, depending on which n- universe more or less they land in, you could have either Aquaman or Namor. I would lean towards having Namor drop into Aquaman's world because oh. Namor would be oh. much more <laughs> territorial. <laughs> Whereas if territorial's drop, a word for it. <laughs> if you drop Aquaman into Namor's world. 
Aquaman's probably going to let bygones be bygones, but uh, yeah, uh, Namor will start a fight. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I could see a story where Namor, you know, takes over Atlantis, you know, and yeah. basically it, reigns as the true ruler of Atlantis in Aquaman's world, you know, and causes a lot of problems and maybe, you know, yeah, starts a war or something between different factions. I could see that being done very well. Namor actually sounds like what if Ocean Master was like good at his job? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he is. Uh, so yeah, I could definitely see a cool crossover potential there, or maybe you know, it's depending on how malicious you want to make Namor. And believe me, there's a spectrum <laughs> there. There's a lot of potential for storytelling with those characters very easily. Obviously, we're talking about ripoff characters coming face to face, like Black Cat and Catwoman. You'd have them. <laughs> that could be a thing. I think you could make a really cool crossover, like heist book, featuring got people like Gambit and Black Cat and Catwoman. Uh, you know, just to name a few. Yeah, and have some c- situation related to what's going on, where they have to steal something from the primary villain or force that's causing this issue, and they're the only ones that are good enough to get in and out and get what they need or whatever the case is, you know? Yeah. I could see that happening. That'd be pretty cool. Ooh. Um, ooh. The Fantastic Four meet the Terrifics. That would be amazing. (laughs) Fuck yes. Put it directly into my veins. Take all of my money. All of it. Yes, please. Oh my God, all of it. I need the Terrifics and I need the Fantastic Four together. (laughs) And I need for the Fantastic Four to call them (laughs) ripoffs. Please. Thank you. I need... For the Terrifics to call the Fantastic Four the ripoffs, and for <laughs> all of the fucking ridiculousness to ensue from that. Oh, I would love it. <laughs> the Terrifics is a great book, by the way. It is still running somehow, and somehow it's the only. It, it's a minor miracle. It's the only new era of DC heroes books that survived, and it makes me sad because there's a lot of good ones, but it's really good. So <sighs> it's a lot so of fun. Good. It's Go into it, you know, maybe a little bit serious, but remember, it's meant to be taken with a big sense of humor throughout, and shenanigans are had, for sure. Plastic Man. It's very aware of what it is, which is a Fantastic Four ripoff that's (laughs) hilarious. Uh, (laughs) Plastic Man versus Mr. Fantastic. Oh, my God. There would be so much shit talking. (laughs) Plastic Man would win on shit talking alone. He would (laughs) would just frustrate him. (laughs) Into be- <laughs> becoming some kind of docile, just limbering Gumby. Just, I just can't deal with this guy anymore. Can we just end this now, please? <laughs> Although, obviously, Plastic Man would easily get outsmarted by... Oh, <laughs> outsmarted, sure. But just having to handle him in any kind of conversation is like, oh, my God. Some, someone shut him up. <laughs> Shut him up. He's so fun, though. Shut him up. <laughs> He's so fun. <laughs> Which is why I love him. I want for Reed Richards to ask, beg someone to get Plastic Man to shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> also, I kind of want to see like what a lifting contest would be between Ben Grimm and Metamorpho. <laughs> yeah, they're very similar characters. Although, ironically, Metamorpho has more... Of like, I don't know. Not really. Yeah, it's like <laughs> he doesn't. Re- yeah, he's not powers, really powers. I wouldn't say not really strength so much as he just Elemental. gets to like. Yeah, he he changes what he's made of. Yeah, is like and you can change see- stuff around him as well, which is cool. So, like, let's see what you're made of. I'm like, I'm made of whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> you don't tell me what I am. <laughs> But I, I think there there's a lot of potential for stuff like that. I would love to see like a Magneto and Lex Luthor crossover on the villain side of things. You know, both very oh objective God. oriented in one way or another, both with a lot of philosophical opinions about the world. I think they would make for a, a really interesting dynamic. You know, the super genius and the super powered ridiculously super powered magneto i think they could make a very formidable crew that has a very interesting story um i would have agreed that that would have been a good idea before hickman got his hands on him obviously we're not talking hickman x-men we're talking 
Typical X Men. <laughs> Typical X Men. Sure. Th- this is the biggest worry that I have <laughs> is that they're going to use the fucking current X Men. I don't think so. I think they would be smart enough to stick with general canon. You think that? <laughs> <laughs> you think that, and I. Where's the Coke? I, <laughs> I, I kind of want to honor and also go along with this blissfully ignorant take that <laughs> so, you want to have so, as far as what I don't they, think it's that ignorant. They, 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 they just have to listen. They, they have to listen, but they're not gonna. They're Marvel. They're, they're drunk on their own like power from the money that they've made from the box office, How and now they think they can do no wrong. such a salty fanboy? <laughs> so salty. <laughs> Uh, when you, you take, do you my gain fa- no joy from these books ever? <laughs> when you take, why, why are you still reading them? Look, when you take my favorite set of characters, <laughs> my favorite character fucked an ape, and I'm still reading <laughs> DC books and looking forward to them. What? Uh, okay. What is stealing your joy, sir? What is stealing my joy? Uh, <laughs> turning all of the X Men into. Oh, we're all uh, locally sourced from our own plant garden. We're all plant-based now. The, like all of our things happen, and all of our all of our costumes. Did Blob did... lose weight on this new he, vegan he, diet? He's the one that I haven't seen yet. They haven't shown Blob, and I think they're afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're afraid to showcase Blob because of what uh, repercussions might come of that online. Whoa. Yeah. Don't faint fat shame, bro. Don't, uh, don't fat shame. Uh, I'm not going to fat shame them. I was like, I, I'm shaming them for not showing the fat one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the thing with Dawn of X, House of X, Powers of X, not that pow- I'm not calling it Powers of 10. Fuck that. That's stupid. <laughs> I don't care if you're using exponents for years past. Um. The problem with it is that they've taken this book of heroes and basically made every single mutant into the brotherhood of mutants. There's no there's no discussion, there's no difference of opinion. They're all they are all on one side. And that destroys what has made the X-Men great. The X-Men have been a source of that discussion, whether or not uh, we should be leaving people separate but equal, or whether or not integration and acceptance of people, no matter what they are, what they can or cannot do, should be a thing. If they use the current X-Men in a crossover with DC, the only thing that I foresee, at least this would be from my perspective, it would be the entirety of the DC pantheon saying, oh no. (laughs) Oh, maybe that's what they need. Maybe they need (laughs) Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman to come in and school these fuckers up. (laughs) Say, no. (laughs) Like you know, the, what you do, no, th- this no, whole, no. This whole ethnostate thing where you guys are preaching mutant supremacy? Yeah, no, you guys, this isn't good. No, it's you, not, You've it's made not enemies good. of the entire world, and mind you, I get it. I really do. We're predicated on the idea that we're tired of the rest of the world making an enemy of us. Let's all just band together and become our own little uh, nation state and make an entire enemy of the world preemptively. Yeah. yeah. So uh, <laughs> if we kept it to the Avengers crossing over with DC, that'd be fine. If we kept it to the Fantastic Four crossing over with DC, that would be wonderful. I want Fantastic Four and the Terrifics to happen yesterday. I want it. If we just made it Spider-Man or Doctor Strange or Ghost Rider or... Well, quite literally every other character than any of the X-Men, that would be fine. But 
The minute you put the X-Men into this bolt, the current, let me be clear, the minute you put the current X-Men into a Marvel DC crossover, and maybe this is what has to happen, once you do that, the biggest question is going to be asked, are we okay with this nation state, ethno state, claiming genetic superiority over the entire rest of the world? Are, are we going to just leave that be? <laughs> I don't think they would. I, th- I, I would hope that they were smart enough to, to know that this crossover doesn't really matter. We're just going to have it for fun, and it's going to be traditional canon characters and people. I'd, I'm predicting it right now. Don't do not do it. I'm going to make don't this do prediction. To, you're doing it to yourself. You're I'm going to make this prediction. You're not going to be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am predicting two possibilities. One, it goes your way. And we get classic iterations of these characters, and everything's fine. It's all fine. Everything works out. And it sells like gangbusters so much that the comic book shops come back with a vengeance. Please. Because everyone wants to buy these books because, oh my God, Marvel and DC are crossing over. Oh my God, this hasn't happened in like 30 years. We need this right now. Let's do it. Or it goes the way that I'm predicting. Such a negative Nancy over here. <laughs> like, I got to be prepared. If I prepare myself, it won't hurt as much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, if it goes the other way, and it goes to where they're crossing over with current iterations of these characters, current iterations of the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom, current iterations of the Avengers, current iterations of all of the Midnight Suns and the Blade, Ghost Rider, Moon Knight, Daredevil, all of those characters. Honestly, I think a Daredevil Nightwing crossover would be that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that could, yeah. I mean, they use Fantas and everything, you know, yeah. together. So I, I, I mean, they're 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 kind of the same, except one can see. Yeah, and one fucks apes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, whatever. I'm not. Uh, I'm not bitter uh, about that y- or anything. Y- y- it doesn't hurt at all. It's like you, you totally had time. I to... think getting fucked by an ape is would definitely hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, look, clearly in that book, the ape was actually asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, dog. That's fair. Th- that oh, being got, you got that iron grip, man. <laughs> 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 totally doesn't try to rip apart a normal ass man. <laughs> Everybody's raping Nightwing. <laughs> Harley Quinn rapes Nightwing in that one animated movie. Oh Maybe god! Tied to the bed, and she just goes, "You know what? Let's try this." And shuts off the light. He didn't say no. He didn't say yes. <laughs> Last I checked, that's not consent. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's definitely not consent to not, not say no, but they were definitely trying to make an implication that because he was smirking at the opportunity that he was fine with it. I'll be sure to do that to my next date. Knock, knock her out in the middle of an alley late (laughs) at night, tie her to a bed and then have a nice little friendly conversation and then rape her. That'll totally be okay because of the implication that we had a friendly conversation before. Look. (laughs) (laughs) And then Harley tried to rape Batman and Batman damned. It was very awkward and very stupid. (laughs) Oh, God. There's a lot of rape going on. Why why are they specifically making Harley a rapist? I don't know. (laughs) It seems unnecessary. Right. What the? Mm. Okay. But yeah. Back to the original topic at hand. Back to the original topic. We get sidetracked very easily. Yeah, we do. Uh, there's a lot of rape going on, though. Uh, hide your wife, hide your kids. Yeah. 
It's something about these Batman characters. They keep trying to make them fucking like the worst circumstances. They really do, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's not cool. No, I don't <laughs> know why not, they keep doing it's it. It's not cool at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's one thing if it's consensual. It's another it, thing it, if you get knocked out in an alley and then get tied to a bed and have to fuck a red ape. Y- yes. It's just Also, um, <laughs> we do not condone in any way, shape, or form the fucking of apes of any kind. <laughs> Rambe would be very upset with this. We're too close to Cincinnati, the epicenter. It hurts. We'll get the ape curse on us. It's not good. We also do not condone, in any way, shape, or form, the acts of one Harley Quinn on either Nightwing (laughs) or Batman. Uh, Or really anybody for that matter. Right. Uh, It should be very obvious that anyone who is actually into being tied up to a bed would not need to be knocked out first. <laughs> yeah. Consent. There's things going Super on Super important. I guess technically she's still a villain, even though they're making her kind of a hero slash anti-villain. I don't know. <sighs> what they're doing with Harley is weird. And they, they ma- keep making They made weirder. her a rapist twice. Yeah. Within like a few years. That's... What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Uh, okay. But yeah, the the crossing over of these two companies. One company m- made Nightwing fucking ape and turned Harley into a rapist twice. The other company turned the X-Men into a mutant supremacist ethnostate that uh, Nikola Tesla would have had a field day with his thoughts on eugenics. Don't forget Snowflake and Safe Space, <laughs> the newest additions to the Marvel pantheon. Right. Alongside Internet Gas Boy and Dora the Explorer. <laughs> internet Gas Boy. I... <laughs> Experimental Internet Gas. That literally sounds like... <clears throat> what an origin. That sounds like an old man farted on his nephew's face. And the VR goggles got fused to his face in the process. That's what that sounds like. While also looking weirdly like a Ben 10 ripoff. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't think about it, but you're right. Yeah. I was down for B negative, though. uh, B negative. Emo vamp kid, I'm totally about. Let's do it. B negative uh, wearing. Give him his own book. uh, Give him his own book and maybe get him out of the whole. Hot topic circa the nineties get up. <laughs> <laughs> like the whole tight leather thing. He and... looks like Superboy, but <laughs> vampire edition. He does look like Superboy. <laughs> <laughs> In the same way that they both look like well, they belong in a gay bar. <laughs> Whoa. Am I wrong? Where's the safe space now? Jeez. Uh, Yikes. Uh, uh, look, safe space only has power when he has people behind him. Yeah, like and the I gay think, bar. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the the YouTube comment section <laughs> prove that <laughs> no one's behind safe space. Oh, and that there are probably even less people behind Snowflake. That's so sad. Uh, uh is it? No, <laughs> no. I'm grateful. I'm no. glad that people are <laughs> cheering this. Yeah, the, the, it's real dumb. The, the it's real dumb. Negative talk is earned for Internet Gas Boy, Dora the Explorer, and Snowflake in Safe Space. I would try to come up with even more stupid names for those characters, but the ones they got are enough. Yeah, that's true. You uh, could do a lot of cool crossovers, like you'd have the Nova Corps and the Green, Green Lantern, Lantern Corps. Yeah, yeah. That one's obvious. Yeah, I mean, that, that one is uh, of an obvious parallel yeah. already. Yeah. But uh, what would be some cool mismatched pairings? Mismatched pairings. Mmm, intriguing. It's like, I'm putting forward something like Spider Man and the question. That'd be interesting. I don't know how it would work exactly, though. The question's pretty damn human. (laughs) He's about as human as it gets. I could see the question and Batman kind of getting along, but again, that's not really a mismatch because they're both they're both DC. Yeah, well, yeah. and they're both detectives. They're both detectives. That's that was what I was getting at. But yeah, 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it'd be so weird because Spider-Man's usually younger and usually more, more humor based questions usually more serious more straightforward spider-man obviously has very fantastic powers question does not <laughs> so it'd be hard for question to keep up <laughs> if they ever got to do anything it uh, would the way that i would pair them up is the only reason the question is ahead of spider-man in any given situation is because the question is asking questions that Spider-Man hasn't even thought to ask. And he's ahead of him on the crime all of the time. Yeah, Whereas Spider-Man's, Spider-Man's always getting, like, the call. He's like, oh, we've got a robbery in progress, blah, 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 blah. Whereas the question's like, hmm, I can already see that this is going to happen, so I need to be there specifically at this time. I know these people do this. These are their patterns. These are who they're associating with. If we can get to the bottom of this, maybe turn this into a story. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I could see it working. It, it, it'd take a pretty skilled writer, though. I think that's... I want to keep it as simple as possible because <laughs> it's so easy to fuck this up. <laughs> so It is. It's so easy to mess this up. I would want to... <laughs> <laughs> Quit adding validity to your argument. Uh, <laughs> I wanna, I I want to steer clear of obvious, you know, things that could go wrong. <laughs> uh, so I would try to keep it low key for the mismatches as much as possible. I would fo- focus more on like personality mismatches more than you know complete power mismatches. Personally, that's what I would do. Personality mismatch would be. Very evident with uh, Doctor Strange and John Constantine. Yeah, for sure. I think Iron Man and Batman would be a clear. Oh yeah. Personality clash between two common characters. Otherwise, they both use kind of high end tech that they create. You know, they're both for their uh, superhero purposes, but they're both very, very <laughs> different people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tony Stark is a real billionaire playboy. Uh, Bruce Wayne is a real billionaire, but a fake-ass playboy. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> He's playing the streets of Gotham every night. Whereas Tony Stark is playing the ladies of... Everywhere. Well, everywhere he's going. <laughs> <laughs> Including the scrolls. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, he willingly tried to fuck a scroll, you know. Oh, he would. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he would fuck a red ape. Probably. To save the world. That's the kind of thing where the very next panel would be now, just there's him. a crossover we need. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> See, Iron Man... God, that would make him an alcoholic all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Warranted. <laughs> I didn't think I'd have to fucking ape to save the world. Uh, who could we pair Flash with? The Flash? Yeah, obviously. The guy who could literally could... solve every universe's problems by just going fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> There's rest, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that Flash. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like how, Obviously, how you... you could try to pair him with speedsters from the Marvel Universe, but... There's only a couple. I don't think it'd be very interesting or very cool. The, see, so, that... It's inherently the, the, the that that brings me back to having to deal with the X Men <laughs> because <laughs> what's the preeminent speedster in Marvel? The one that everyone liked in Days of Future yeah, Past, Quicksilver. Yeah, yeah, the one that died in Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one that died, even though he could watch a bullet in slow motion, maybe yeah. a few scenes before. Well, he could watch a bullet go into his chest. Oh my! He God. did that pretty well. How? dare you <laughs> <laughs> i already have enough issues with that movie as his <laughs> that movie's terrible <sighs> it's really bad Ugh. fresh wounds you defended it too <sighs> did i you did <laughs> i take back everything i said they killed quicksilver <laughs> the one who should be 
the least killable in the entire team. He goes faster than everyone. Yeah, it's probably because he would break the whole Thanos fight if he could just run up, steal the rock, <laughs> and leave. He, You're not wrong. He breaks all of Endgame. He's like, he, he's like <laughs> literally Quicksilver solves Endgame by himself. Pretty much. Yeah. That's the thing with the Flash. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... You have to make him stupid in order to <laughs> <laughs> prevent him from saving the world and every single Justice League issue. And uh, here's the thing. That's why Wally West worked so well. Yeah. Because he was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> he was an idiot who didn't really have Star Labs figuring out all of his powers for him. Yeah. He just kind of winged it, which was fine. Mm -hmm. That is how a, a speedster should work. Otherwise, tension doesn't exist for that character. Yeah, that's true. The only thing that makes Quicksilver work is because half of the time he's evil. <laughs> that you is, know me, I like my evil. The thing that would happen in a meeting between the Flash and Quicksilver that would actually make that work is Qu Quicksilver has to be a bad guy. Yeah. It's like that, that's the only way that that works. Otherwise... The, the two of them get to the bottom of why the crossover happened in like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I got another one. This one just came to mind. You could have a crossover between Blade and I Vampire. That could work really well. Blade sees all these fucking vampires and thinks, I'm going to murder every fucking one of these idiots. <laughs> and then they go, no, not all of us are bad. Stop. That could lead to obvious conflicts. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I want it for no other reason than one of the f one of my favorite things that I ever read involving Blade was him having a dream in which he woke up in the Twilight universe and got to stab both Bella and Edward. <laughs> The best room he ever it's had. It's a famous panel. You can it, find it on Google. I love that panel. It's ridiculous. My pa that is like one of my favorite panels of all time. <laughs> but like, yeah, this could be a, a fun crossover yeah. for sure. Like one of my favorite things from the HBO series True Blood was like in the first episode where we're talking about a world where vampires are just out and proud. One of the other guys in... That uh, backwater Louisiana town, he just uh, kind of walks off to himself and kind of wish, you know what would be really cool? Just have someone like Blade come through and just like kill all these vampires because I don't like them. <laughs> you know, I had a thought for something that <laughs> might be really interesting. Uh, I was racking my brain because I love this character so much yeah. on who he could match up with pretty well. Martian Manhunter. Who I really love as a character, hmm. and Vision. Oh, I, I oh, think, that would be interesting. I think that would be really cool for several reasons. A, Martian Manhunter probably can't read his mind because he's a robot. Basically. Yeah, uh, he's synthetic in origin. So, if he can read his mind, that implies that he has an organic brain of some sort. If he can't, then obviously, you know, he's not organic whatsoever. He's synthetic. That would and bring up a very interesting cause, trust dynamic. Yeah, so that would be like a trust dynamic that Martian Manhunter's never experienced before, where he can't cover his bases and kind of peek into the mental yeah, th there's, workings. Th there's a physical being there with powers very similar to his own, Yeah, but he can't read him. And they're both <laughs> very similar in their character because you know Martian Manhunter is somebody who's very much not human who does not come from a human world and has to kind of adapt and learn how to be human more or less in order to kind of hide within society and yeah, it, ha have a life. Seeing Whereas humanity Vision, from an outside perspective. Vision has the same kind of dynamic going on, but from a different yeah, perspective. His, his, He's coming his, from something that was created by humans to serve humans right? and has to... He wants seemingly to become human in some way shape or form more and more and more right as a synthetic life form but never quite gets there it's like the characters who are just this close to just being human but that 
there's always that uh, that that X factor that keeps them from well, just being like an actual human. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of philosophical potential <laughs> if you have a, a more heady thoughtful writer i think that could be a really cool book a really that could be a really thoughtful character driven book you know that focuses on these two characters that feel for lack of a better term alien in this human world <laughs> and that is a really good way of putting it <laughs> desperately want to integrate in some way shape or form and have a life of their own that they can carve out and you can have a general overlaying story but focus primarily on the character interactions between the two. And over time, they kind of learn together more what it means to be human, you know, by learning yeah. from each other how they are each seen, you know, from a human perspective. And I think I think that could be really cool and work really well. Obviously, like you said, they have very similar powers in a lot of ways. So they would obviously work very well together. They'd probably have similar thought processes, you know, on how to deal with situations. Um I just think it'd be really interesting, really cool. I think there's a lot of meat on the bones for that type of crossover. But again, you'd have to have a very thoughtful, heady writer that really is dedicated to writing such a story. Hey, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we're here. We could totally double as writers. No big deal. We could totally save your company. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Villain pairings. Yeah, well, I already told you I like Mag like classic Magneto and Lex Luthor. I think they could be very interesting because Magneto, in a lot of ways, is something that Luthor should hate and fear, which is exactly what Magneto hates, which is <laughs> humans that unnecessarily fear him you yeah. know, and want to hurt him or get rid of him. But I could see them coming to an understanding, you know, to try to get rid of what's opposing them and have a kind of interesting villain back and forth dynamic where clearly they're both kind of thinking ahead you know what am i going to do with him once we're finished how about comedy pairings comedy pairings can we I'm, please I'm we got lobo love... which can... would make a great comedy pairing i'm sure got can... howard the duck <laughs> okay that would be funny <laughs> <laughs> can we please for the love of god deadpool I was going to say anyone but him. Oh, Literally anyone but oh, him. A any, you know it's going to happen. Any pairing with Deadpool, I don't care how... Deadpool is the crossover king. Oh, my God. He crossovers, crosses over with everyone. Okay. Deadpool crossing over would be fine if it sounded anything like Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> Comics. And how about, here's how about thing Deadpool and Green Lantern? That crossover already happened. <laughs> it happened in Deadpool 2. As you can clearly see, uh, Deadpool went and shot Ryan Reynolds in the head before he could make that movie. That's true. As it should be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Deadpool... Deadpool is only the crossover king because all of the writers want to cross him over and barely any of them get the crossover right. Barely any of them. They know. always make him a fucking idiot. Well, yeah. Because <laughs> he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> okay. He's crude. He's crass. He's an asshole. But he's not a fucking idiot. Are you sure? <laughs> Seems like that's pretty canon by now. Oh, my God. The, 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 this is the thing that I hate about the Deadpool canon. <laughs> is because they keep trying to make him an idiot. He is. That works once. It's worked a few times. I swear to God. <laughs> He's an idiot with Wolverine. He's an idiot with Cable. He's an idiot with Spider-Man. What more do you need? <sighs> Here's the thing. You've already done that. Do you really want to see him being it an idiot with Batman? Yes. Do you want to see him being an idiot with Superman? Do you want to yes. see him being an idiot with Black Canary? Uh, yeah, definitely, yes. <laughs> Black Canary would be perfect. She'd beat his ass <laughs> every time, and he'd be making totally inappropriate jokes about her. She wouldn't beat his ass. 
She would scream at the resonant frequency of his body and make him fucking explode so he shuts the fuck up. <laughs> Perfect. The story writes itself. Oh, th- that is one page. <laughs> <laughs> that is one page. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> that's not a crossover. That's a Give him some chimichanga a... quotes and break the fourth wall. You got a whole book. That that has a pr- add some Snickers ads in there. His crossover would be an ad for someone else's more substantial crossover. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool is great. Comic book Deadpool, on the other hand, hasn't been done right since De- Cable and Deadpool. I think you're just too jaded. I think uh, you've been hurt too many times, and you just <laughs> you can't find the joy in your Marvel books anymore. I I think. The big mouse has stolen your joy. Uh Actually, I take that back. There is one crossover that I do like post Cable and Deadpool. And it's probably going to seem pretty obvious to you. Deadpool and Gambit. Oh, (laughs) duh. (laughs) What a mark. (laughs) Look, I'm just saying, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels was a great movie. <laughs> it's a great movie, and uh, of it, course, you'd it, like the Gambit book. It, it's a very easy thing to do. <laughs> it, if you make, if you make a heist, the core of the story, and then you get to watch the two of these characters fumble over each other, fight with each other, out asshole each other. <laughs> that is comedy gold. It, like, oh, but, it, when, if you... but when Wolverine and Spider-Man and Cable do it with them, not comedy gold. It's not comedy gold because they're fighting the premise. <laughs> <laughs> it like I like it. it. Gambit works with the story, not against it, not against Deadpool. How does Spider-Man work against Deadpool? By preventing him from all of the murder that he tries to do. <laughs> like half of what Deadpool... Wolverine does nothing but murder people. If the murdering is the problem. <laughs> okay, you you clearly aren't up on current Wolverine. We're not talking about current Wolverine. We've already established that <laughs> Hickman Wolverine will not be involved. <laughs> yeah. Right, because that would bring up far more questions that would probably uh go Answered in a way that most people wouldn't like, considering that uh, people who keep up with DC don't keep up with Marvel nearly as much. And people might be a little confused at him alluding to maybe making out with Cyclops instead of alluding to trying to beat the fuck out of Cyclops so that he can have Gene. <laughs> hot. <laughs> Some hot cuck action. <laughs> I think what could be interesting <laughs> is if you made like a hodgepodge of the worst villains oh. in both the pantheons. You have like Mirror Master and <laughs> Kite Man, <laughs> <laughs> just all these fucking useless villains, and pair them up, put the Blob in there. You know, Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> you have Shocker for sure. Uh, I feel like that has a lot of potential if you just made a Misfits Super League of just terrible villains and just had them doing whatever. The fucking guppy. I, God, not the guppy. Not the son of King Sturgeon. Oh, no. Oh, so dumb. God, they love ruining Nightwing books. They do. <laughs> so bad. They do. They hate him so much. They really do, though. They can't help but fuck his books up. I don't know why. It's not that hard. <laughs> why? They want to kill him so badly. They do. They want the fans to stop liking him so badly. It's just... <sighs> it, it, they're tied to Batman's nuts so goddamn hard that they just won't let Nightwing essentially be Batman to a point. Like they they don't want him to be that. They just he doesn't even have to be Batman two point Just let him be. <laughs> just leave him alone. All right. Just 
Let him have his own villains. Let him have his own characters. It's just so bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> why do they do this? Uh, because they hate you. <laughs> <laughs> you could have damage go up against Thunderbolt Ross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was only good for an hour. <laughs> I was going to say the stamina jokes write themselves. <laughs> <laughs> like He's got one hour. Let's do this. Now, one thing I do have to say, Marvel has a lot less useless villains than DC. <laughs> DC has a lot of useless fucking stupid villains. Yeah, they do. Most of Marvels are at least... It's like, what the fuck does the penguin do when this shit happens? <laughs> <laughs> now that... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Uh, what now, does he do? <laughs> on that thought, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. I wasn't ready for that. I was thinking earlier, but I I forgot to mention it. One thing that could be really cool is having gang wars, like having Kingpin, ooh, and Black Mask or Penguin, ooh, you know, kind of trying to d- take over the cities, whatever this merged universe is crossover universe is i think that can make for a really compelling story where you have these different crime factions all going at it for the same territories anything that brings the midnight suns together is a win in my book so i think that has a ton of potential to be really cool and really interesting i think kingpin's an obvious big dog in that fight but black mask and penguin are obviously also very uh competitive criminal masterminds in you know the kind of traditional mob sense oh yeah this bring bring out the the crime families oh my god there's so much you could do with that and it would have to involve spider-man and daredevil at the very least (laughs) honorable (laughs) member So we're looking at a list of Marvel villains, and we got all the way to the bottom of the top 100. The 100th one is J. Jonah Jameson. (laughs) And he's listed as honorable member on (laughs) comicvine.gamespot.com, top 100 Marvel villains. (laughs) I love that they put that as, as the last villain. What could be more villainous? than consistently firing people for not getting him pictures of (laughs) (laughs) Spider-Man. It's a conspiracy, I tell you. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, I I mean, there's obviously tons of potential fans out there. If you got some suggestions or ideas, by all means, comment them, send them to us on Twitter or email them to us, uh, whatever you want to do, and we'll read them on the next episode of the show. There's, Uh, oh my God. Because, again... There's probably not going to be much news beyond impending death uh, for at least a few weeks. So yeah, content's going to be a little light, I would imagine, outside of our comic movie master list. So with that, unless you got any other really big ideas you wanted to share. No, I'm going to rest on the Deadpool and Damien one. All right. That, <laughs> that one was that, that was really I got to give it to you. That one's brilliant. Yeah, that one's really good. Uh, <clears throat> with that note, we'll go ahead and end the show. Once again, thank you for watching. We are very grateful to all of you. If you feel kind enough to support us and help keep the show running, we do have a Patreon page. It's patreon.com forward slash hit the books. If you'd like to contribute, once again, thank you to Heather Reap for being an executive producer level on the show. There are some tiers you can take advantage of if you so choose. If you don't want to pay, that's just fine. We're happy to have you here. Just please give us a like, give us a subscribe, anything you can do to help us out. We'd very much appreciate it. It helps us branch out and appeal to more people, reach more people. Once again, we're on Twitter at HTPVids. We're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hit the books. Um, you can always email us at hit the books vids, V I D S, at gmail.com. You always comment on our YouTube channel if you want to talk to us or interact with us. We're pretty good about responding. So be sure to take advantage of that if you want to suggest some talk- topics of the show, especially right now when we're kind of struggling for you know stuff to talk about just because of all the issues going on. Um, yeah. <clears throat> 
So feel free to send us out some uh, feelers and suggestions. We'll be more than happy to use them, especially if you contribute to the Patreon. It's actually part of one of the tiers that we do read out one of your selected questions every month. Um, Once again, try to help out your local comic book shops if you can. I know times are tough. You know, reach out to them if you can. A lot of them do have some kind of fundraisers going on, oftentimes done by fans of the shop not just themselves being greedy or anything like that again it's not about greed it's about paying their employees <laughs> making yeah. sure that everybody's got food on the table you know they're talking about a kind of a stipend of 1200 bucks right now but that's nothing you know to, not for a business yeah. owner especially not for a one-time payment you know yeah. it might barely get you through a month but You'll be barely scraping by at that, and if this goes on till late May, June, so on and so forth, then there's no way twelve hundred's enough. It's just not, not even a little bit. You can't, it, it, you can't was, pay rent with twelve hundred bucks, you know, more than one or two times at most, depending on what you're currently living at. And remember, a lot of people are living, you know, well beyond a zero dollar means. You know, they're living for what they were being paid, and now they're not being paid. So right, um, like uh, unless somehow they revisit the idea and make it a monthly thing for the duration of this social distancing that we're experiencing right now, uh, a one time twelve hundred dollar payment. It's it that's barely going to have people survive for like three months yeah it's it's a pittance to be honest compared to what they're giving to corporations <laughs> so if you yeah. see the fine print it's like a few hundred billion for people and then like everything else of the two trillion is going to business that's right uh, it's, it's silly uh, i have issues with it i'm not going to get into it right now but yeah uh, there's a lot that we could talk about about that but uh that's a bit Beyond the scope of what we're doing here. <laughs> Trying to keep it comic books and, again, be happy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we, we will have done a lighthearted topic for once. So. Yeah. Uh, let's try to keep it that way. Sorry. Sorry for getting dark there. Uh, but, again, thank you again for watching. We're on YouTube. We're on Stitcher. We're on Podbean. We're on Spotify. We're on... Uh, not on SoundCloud. Fuck them. Uh, Fuck them. <laughs> read an RSS feed. Why can't you read an RSS feed? Jeez. How is that so hard? Come on, guys. We're in 2020. Figure it out. You got plenty of time now. You're in quarantine. Yeah. Like, what else are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm not trying to be mean to the SoundCloud guys. Uh, Just very frustrating trying to add to their infrastructure, and then they just don't have the stuff in place. Um, Be better. Be better. (laughs) But then again, we're all about mediocre on this show. Mediocre! (laughs) Uh, So think i touched on everything hopefully i didn't forget anything once again be sure to check out batman circa 1966 and there will be a link in the description for both the podcasts and the youtube channel uh if you want to check that out for free again don't tattle on them (laughs) (laughs) because we know wb they really go after their rights so no matter how old just just watch it watch it enjoy share with anybody else that wants to enjoy be sure to watch it because we will be posting it next week. So look forward to that. The second episode of Comic Movie Master List. It is coming down the line. And then if you missed the first episode, Superman and the Mole Men circa 1951, be sure to check that out as well. It's a lot of fun. A lot of good stuff on there. A lot of fun. Thank you very much for watching another mediocre edition of Hit the Books Podcast. Mediocre! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank, for all, thank you all for watching. We will miss you. Stay healthy. Stay clean. Wash your hands. Goodbye. And stay sane. If you can. Uh, If you're going to go nuts, uh, go nuts on your local politician. Well, maybe not that, but at least make a good story of it. Yeah. We got to make movies after all. Right. Uh, That's what we're all about, right? We need comic book material. Yeah. Go create some. Or don't. Yeah. (laughs) Do you? This is a terrible suggestion. (laughs) (laughs) We're terrible people.